Welcome to Dead Man Talking. Tonight's show is the returning series to the Agent in the Wood series by 02321 over on Reddit No Sleep. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And so, with that aside, let's get into tonight's story. Entitled Agent in the Woods Harvest Moon Fever Part 1 Let's get straight into that. I was fully contented, never seeing anything strange or supernatural for another year, and when my new agent friend came back. However, I was still researching as much as possible in the past few months to figure out what happened in the woods, only to come across nothing. No mention about strange agents, or the odd sleeping bag caterpillar monsters. At least, nothing about strange events that fit the descriptions of the ones I met. The local librarian probably thought I was a nut, checking out all the occult-related books and looking for answers. The research was to keep my mind off one issue that came from my grandfather's death. After he passed away, he left the cabin and the land to me. The land itself was worth a fortune if I ever sold it. And I knew if I did, the forest would be cleared for a lakeside condos or a cabins. And I couldn't do that. I was a city person, but I grew to love these woods and the small town. My grandfather also left me a pretty sizable cash inheritance to ensure I would never have to worry about working, it's if I lived on a budget. That is what caused the issue. My father was so offended about my grandfather, leaving so much to me and so little to him, that we had a huge fight over it. And what Grandpa John left the rest of the family wasn't nothing, but it wasn't the same amount that I received. I refused to sell the land, and when he got so angry about it, I pushed back. I would have gladly given him a great deal of the money that I now owned, because I felt guilty over it. And all those ideas were tossed aside after how he acted when I refused the land sale. We still had it made up, and no one in my family was talking to me aside from my sister, who was quirky in her own way. I just couldn't describe. She didn't look affected by the split in our family. She just waved her fake nails and dismissed the worries in her false New York accent. I have no idea why she spoke like that when she's never been to New York, but her odd way of speaking comforted me. As the months passed, the summer turned to fall. I made friends with the locals and Darry, the man who owned the bait shop, taught me a lot about fishing. On occasions, we went out onto the dock and he told me stories about my grandfather I would never have known otherwise. When I was alone fishing on the dock, I ran through what happened in the summer through my head looking for answers. I met a white creature that offered me any wish in order for it to use the land for meetings. I used it to save Agent 202, or Tuli, as I nicknamed him and to give him freedom from that creature. He went off shortly after and promised me that we would meet again. I never asked him if he was still working for the creature, and if he was, why? Well, that creature may have let him go free, but I was under the impression all the agents are Tuli's brothers. Was he staying for them? I might ask one day, but it was a hard topic to bring up. I didn't want him to feel as if he owed me. It just felt like the only thing I could ask for at the time. I also wondered what my grandfather's wish had been. Money would make sense because he left so much of it when he passed, but I didn't feel as if that was very likely because I believed him and Tully were involved back then. I never confirmed it, but there was a rumour of good old Grandpa John being caught with an agent all those years ago, and from how Tully couldn't even face me when he wanted to confirm that my grandfather really passed away, cemented the idea in my head it was him who cared for the landowner so long ago. Well, I was going out of my head from not working and not having any answers. I simply had too much time on my hands and didn't want to wait until next year for Tully to come back so I could wrestle some information out of him. I almost accepted my frustrating year when something happened. I forgot to lock the door and a creature had got into my cabin. Again. This time, I cannot blame it on a hungry raccoon. I heard noises in the middle of the night and regretted the fact I had bought a gun. 
I just felt like a lot of work filling out the forms, and I just never got around to doing it. Pans clattered to the ground in the kitchen. I suppressed a yelp of fear. I did buy a baseball bat, so I grabbed it and a flashlight to go on down the stairs. I was a little bit braver this time and shone my light directly into the kitchen with my bat in hand. And I still nearly fainted when I saw a white face smiling back at me in the beam of the light. It was one of those caterpillar creatures I'd seen in the woods months ago. I hadn't seen any since then and prayed they were gone. This thing smiling in my cabin proved me wrong. I was plump with knobby legs. A dark black fabric-like texture covered its body, making it look like a sleeping bag. A white, almost mask-like face looked over at me, with its eyes scrunched up from a wide smile and with needle-like teeth showing. The bastard had a box of table salt between its knobby legs. Mine! The thing spoke. I backed up as my heart leapt into my throat. I might have a weapon, but not enough courage to use it. It turned and scuttled out of the open back door, somehow carrying a box of salt in its knobs. Once it was outside, I slammed the door shut and locked it. I did not sleep for that night, over wondering just how many more of them could be out there in those woods. The experience of seeing that creature gave me a paranoia of making sure all my doors and windows were locked, but it also gave me an idea. A stupid idea that might put myself in danger, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. Those creatures could talk, and that means I might be able to ask it some questions. When the sun set, I'd already laid out my plan of action. I placed some raw meat, cupcakes and carrots on plates and left them outside the back door. I could see the back porch from the kitchen window, and I waited. I didn't know what the creature ate besides salt and put out a few things to pick from. I expected to wait long, but the creature must have smelled the food and came up to the back porch after only an hour. It slowly came up the steps being well aware someone was watching it. It didn't even have time to react. The moment it reached the plates, it inhaled all the food and was practically flying off the back steps. I would need a lot more food to keep it still for longer. I considered buying a life trap, but thought it might be too smart for one of those. I could open up doors, after all. I didn't have much else to do, so I went to the slow and steady approach. I could either feed it to the point where it couldn't move or get it comfortable with me. The teenage cashier, Linda, saw me buy extra food, but she didn't mention it. I thought small town folk were all nosy and into gossip. People here tended to keep to their own business, which was good. I really couldn't explain what I was doing. I ran into the sheriff while I was heading back from buying food for my new fresh creature, and he stopped me for some small talk. Ah, have you heard anything strange up near your cabin lately? He asked. The question felt loaded to me. He was smiling as he spoke, so I doubted he was referring to any kind of supernatural creature. Uh, no, nothing. Why? I replied, hoping to sound normal. Well, some people running out one of the cabins near you came across a sick-looking raccoon. Well, we're looking into trapping it. Just be careful, all right? Don't want you to need some rabies shot. I nearly sighed in relief. Just a raccoon. So far, no one ever mentioned those sleeping bag creatures. Either no one had ever seen them, or didn't want to talk about them. I was glad that some of the town folks were friendly enough towards me to warn me about a rabid raccoon in the area. And since my huge fight with my family... I was feeling a bit lonely up in the cabin, and someone showing that they cared. Oh, it was nice. I should have taken his warning a bit more seriously, and putting food out when there was a hungry and messed up coon around well, it was not a good idea. But I didn't even have a second thought as I put out some more very salted raw steaks on the back porch, because those appeared to be my monster's favourite. Some nights I didn't stay by the back door to watch it eat. That night I was doing dishes, and facing away from the window. And just as the sun was setting, I heard some of the most horrible noises I have ever heard coming from the back of the cabin. I rushed to the door, hands still wet to see what was going on. And outside, the creature I'd been feeding was in a bad tussle with a very fat raccoon, and I felt my heart drop. Hey! I shouted at the two of them. I grabbed my baseball bat from the back door. I smiley stayed on the back porch, knowing getting in the middle of a fight with... Only result in a rabies shut. I watched helpless as the creature fought and had some nubby legs torn off. Blood and fur flew from the both of them. The fight only lasted a few minutes and when it did, the raccoon started to chase the monster 
off into the woods. And I made the foolish choice to grab my jacket and my flashlight to go after them. If that creature died, I would lose any ounces it held. Once again, I thought what I was doing was stupid and dangerous. Or there could be more of those caterpillar creatures out in the woods. I had seen one kill a deer before and changed into something else. If I came across a bigger one of those things, I could easily eat me, even though the smaller one couldn't win against a raccoon. I kept following the trail of footprints in the dirt, my flashlight guiding me along into the woods. I should have brought a weapon with me that was better than an old baseball bat that I bought for a dollar at a yard sale. And while walking, I thought I heard twigs snapping off in the distance. I looked off into the dark trees trying to see anything out of the ordinary, and if I didn't find the creature soon, I would need to turn back. I would regret not being able to help it, though. Well, they were creepy as hell, but I got slightly attached to my new stray, even if it would eat me, if given the chance. As I moved further into the woods, I started to lose track of the little footprints until finally they disappeared. I scanned the tree branches with my light, wondering if it climbed the tree and that's why the trail went cold. Nothing but leaves and no sign of the monster that I was looking for. While lowering my flashlight, the beam caught something. A flash of white, and my heart leapt as I hoped it was the unnerving white face of the creature. Well, it was not. Instead, it was a white sheet of fabric wrapped around something dark. Too dark for me to make out the shape. A simple eye symbol was crudely painted on the fabric with red paint. And I stood, puzzled over why something like that would be in the woods. And then, what the fabric was wrapped around stood up. My throat closed up, making it impossible for me to make a sound. The thing that was now standing a few feet from me was nothing like the sleeping back creatures I'd seen before. It looked almost human, a body covered in pitch black fur with massive clawed hands at its side. The fabric was wrapped around the top part of the creature's face, leaving a wolf's snout visible. And when it took a step towards me, I ran. I only took a few steps while that thing gained on me at a frightening speed. I tripped on a root slamming into the ground and dropping my flashlight. Even if I didn't trip, I never would have gotten away from this monster. And by the time that I rolled over, the thing was on top of me. Claw slammed down into the dirt beside my head, and the wolf's face inches away from my own. I let out a small squeak of a scream, but no other noise came. When it opened its huge mouth, its countless teeth shone in the moonlight, ready to take my head off. I don't know what made me act the way I did but it saved my life. Before it closed the jaws around my tender flesh, I reached over and pulled off the fabric covering the beast's eyes. It was an ungraceful movement, and I slammed my elbow against the hard ground while pulling it away from the monster. It froze the moment its eyes were exposed. Snapping those jaws shut, we both looked at each other, frozen in shock. I would have never expected to see such a pair of eyes on a creature so frightening. Instead of glowing red or orange ones, I was staring into a pair of glittering pearls. They shone so brightly, even a small amount of moonlight was reflected off the trees, causing light flickering reflections of light to surround us. The thing let out a strangled choking sound from its throat and just disappeared into thin air. It was just... gone. I remained on the ground sweating and my heart beating like a racehorse. I did not understand what it was or what even happened. The only proof it was real with the piece of fabric still in my hand. I stood up on shaking legs to look around and try and spot signs of where the creature went. And instead, I saw someone who made my jaw drop open. What are you doing here? The newcomer and I spoke in unison. Agent in the Woods Harvest Moon Fever Part 2 Let's get straight into that. Tully was walking towards me, looking completely furious. I almost didn't recognize him out of his suit. Instead, he wore a black bomber-style jacket with a black shirt under it. He still had sharp dress pants and polished shoes on, in the woods. I haven't seen any traces of him in the last few months and doubted I would see him until next year. Now he stopped in front of me, jaw clenched, and it looked like he was grinding his teeth in rage. If he was here, then it meant something was going on. His blue eyes darted to the fabric in my hand, and he snatched it away. 
What are you doing with this? Did you come across Vow? Did you come across something? He held out the white fabric, accusing me of snooping again. I felt my head swim a little from not only seeing him again, but also from what just happened. And I stood, shocked, and didn't try to pick up my flashlight. I, I, I just... I, I think I saw a werewolf. I stammered not believing the words that came out of my own mouth. What I saw seconds ago did look like a werewolf, but that couldn't be it. Werewolves weren't real. I could accept whatever I'd seen in these woods a few months ago, but I drew the line at werewolves. And Tilly looks me over, his anger fading. And placing a hand on my shoulder, he forced me to step forward. I'll get you home. My old warning still stands. Stay out of these woods. At least for a few days. When I started to move, I felt a heat coming from his hand and through my jacket. My head suddenly flushed and I looked at him confused at the odd change. You're hot, I commented, looking at the hand that was on my shoulder. Excuse me, he asked, eyebrow raised, and after a bit of a pause. In those few seconds it took him to answer back, I felt a wave of nausea hit me. My head started to pound and my entire body felt feverish. Unable to control myself, I bent over and unloaded my dinner onto the ground in front of us. Tears streamed down my face as bile came through my nose because of the angle. It was not pleasant. I stayed like that for what felt like forever. Even after my stomach was empty, something was wrong for me to suddenly become so ill. This was not due to shock or anything along those lines. I totally stayed by me until I was well enough to move, and slowly he started to guide me along to a small clearing. I felt like I might get sick again at any moment as I took small steps. When he found a decent spot, he held me down and got my jacket off. He folded it so I could rest my head. He then shrugged off his own jacket to fold it and place it over my eyes. And somehow, the small amount of moonlight being blocked out minimalized the dizziness. I folded my hands on my chest trying to focus on not getting sick again. Why do I... Why do I feel so terrible? My voice was hoarse from getting sick. My mouth tasted awful and I wished I had some water. Valik hit you with a spell. Normally you can walk it off, but I didn't notice fast enough. Stay down and take a break and don't move too much, or else. Or else what? I puke my stomach out? Actually, yes, along with other organs. I glanced from under his jacket and there was enough moonlight to see him leaning against a tree, arms folded. His tone was very serious and I tried my very best to stay as still as possible. My brain went back to the fact that the spell was what was making me so ill. I'd seen creatures, and yet I never even considered magic was real. I just saw the creatures as something natural, and with logical rules. I just didn't understand. Magic werewolf? I took it made me feel slightly better, despite my sore throat. I had a lot of questions, and for once, Tuli was answering them. Valik is part of a nomad tribe that are genius spellcasters. I don't know werewolves, but you wouldn't know that. They only have wolf form as a bipedal one, not human one. Uh, sorry, I'm still stuck on the magic thing. And why would he put a spell on me? He could have easily killed me. Valik is shy. You saw his face. Well, that answer threw me off more than the idea of magic. That monster could bite me in half and he was shy. I did explain the behavior after the hood was removed. I wish that that monster didn't have that trait. I'd almost rather be in torn apart than feeling this sick. Why are you even inside these woods in the first place? After what you saw the last time, I expected you to stay away. Tilly was finally scolding me for coming into the woods at night. Well, he was right, and I didn't really have a good reason. I, uh, I was trying to find one of those caterpillar creatures. I, I thought of maybe... They could speak and answer some questions that I have. I explained and braced myself for more verbal abuse for my dumb idea. I heard the agent sigh and peeked over at him to catch him shaking his head at my answer. And there shouldn't be any of them still in these woods after I meet him. It's my job to collect them. However, I was injured. I left the task for the younger agents. And I suppose they did a poor job of it. I started to wonder just how many of those creatures that were left behind. I saw the one, but who knows how many were missed. Aside from them, there was something else going on inside these woods. And Tully wouldn't be here otherwise. So, uh, why are you here? I thought you came by once a year. 
It's not as if I'm not happy to see you. Are you hunting that werewolf that just attacked me? He looked at me for a long time as if carefully choosing his words. I knew his kind met once every year, but I wasn't aware of his job. I did ask for his freedom in the summer, and was unsure if he could even return for the yearly meeting. But I also considered he might just not know what else to do besides remaining with his mysterious family. It was a hard topic to bring up. It was his life, after all. If he wanted to keep working until he found something else he enjoyed, it wasn't my place to stop him. No, I'm working with him, he said finally. So, he was on the job. His answers about his work were scarce. In fact, I think this was the longest conversation we'd had. And yet, I still pressed for more answers. So, you're a government agent working with a werewolf? That sounds like a trashy romance novel plot. I heard him make a sound of annoyance. He didn't want to give out answers, but he also didn't want me getting the wrong idea. I'm not a government agent. More of a contractor. My brothers and I, the agents, offer our services to whoever they will pay. Sometimes it's for the government to deal with a supernatural trouble. This time, a tribe related to Valak asked me here. I was still in the area. And it's always good to have spellcasters like them. I was a few favours. So, government contractor working for a pack of werewolves. Gotcha. I was feeling a little bit better and almost ready to sit up. Until Tootie said I should, I thought it was best not to risk it. They're not. He started to correct me, wondering if it was worth it. Around me, you can call them werewolves. But please, try not to say it around Valak. You already traumatised him by seeing his eyes. Uh, what should I call them? I asked. I thought back to the eyes I saw for a few seconds. I wondered why the beast was so embarrassed about them. Surely anyone with such nice eyes would want to show them off. They are... Again he paused, looking from under the jacket towards him. And looking from under the jacket towards him, I saw he had his hand over his eyes, looking a little bit in pain. I can't say it. It's too stupid. He admitted. Now, I need to know. He shook his head, refusing to answer my question. I started to sit up, and he lowered his hand, looking a little worried. The movement would make me sick again. Then he realized I was using myself as a hostage until he spilled what he was hiding. They named themselves Wolf Wolves. His voice sounded strained and a little embarrassed. They may be genius spellcasters, but not that bright when it comes to other things. I held back my laughter from his discomfort and from the poor name choice. It wasn't much better considering the nickname I gave my agent friend. He silently decided it was time to get me back home. He lifted me back to my feet and we collected our coats. I didn't feel as bad as expected, but he still needed to support my weight as we walked along through the dark woods back to the cabin. So, if, if these wolf things are real, how about vampires? I asked, trying to focus on anything but my ill stomach. Yup, Tootie answered with no hesitation. Uh, Bigfoot? Nessie? Yup. Are you just... Are you just agreeing with everything to mess with me? I glanced up at him while he kept his eyes forward. And after a small pause, he answered again. Yup. I might have gotten some answers tonight, but I wondered how many were the truth. It was hard to tell if Tootie just had a bad sense of humour or was trying to throw me off. I was glad to know that a wolf creature was working with him, but I was never told what they were doing in these woods. Something was going down and I was in no state to force the answers from him. More questions needed to wait until I rested for a while. As we walked up to the cabin, I saw a familiar shape near the porch steps. As we got closer, I could make out what it was. It looked like one of those caterpillar creatures, but with odd hands along its body instead of the knobby ones. When it heard us coming up, it stood up on all of those legs that were not long enough to support its plump body. And from behind, a large raccoon tail stood up, and so those hands were raccoon hands. Slowly, it waddled over, the smile plastered on its white face, looking as disturbing as ever. And since I could manage on my own, Tully walked away to scoop the creature into his arms. It wriggled trying to get free and its teeth ripping into his jacket. He didn't even seem to notice how hard this thing was struggling. I don't understand how. He's so fat. He shouldn't be like this unless he's got into the garbage or junk food. 
I felt sweat start at the base of my neck as I thought about all the table scraps and junk I'd fed one of those creatures, trying to catch it for answers. Surely this wasn't the same one. I remember the deer and how one of those monsters changed from eating it. There was a chance the one I was feeding caught the raccoon and changed. I may have... I started and didn't need to finish the sentence. My strange friend turned his head towards me, understanding immediately. His cold eyes locked onto mine and he tightened the grip on the squishy creature that almost squirmed away. Inside the cabin, now! He hissed through gritted teeth. I understood and walked past him as fast as my body would let me. If he found out I was feeding that creature before I'd got sick, he might have laid into me about it. I did something stupid and didn't need him telling me so. I hurried up the front steps, my stomach churning, but I didn't let it slow me down. I only paused when I got to the door and looked over my shoulder to see Tully still angrily staring at me. And in that moment, I was more scared of him compared to anything else I'd come across. I changed my clothing and brushed my teeth, which was greatly needed. And still feeling terrible, I went right to sleep to deal with all the strange events and new information for when I woke up. Agent in the Woods Harvest Moon Fever Part 3 Let's get straight into that. I found out Tully was in the area doing a job with a web also. That was a start. When I walked outside the cabin to take a trip into town, I heard rustling under the front porch. I'm peering under it, expecting an animal. Instead, I saw the fat raccoon hybrid staring back at me. It threw me off for a second. I thought the agent would have taken it away by now. Why did he leave it here? And as it came closer to me, I guessed at the answer. Squirming along and dragging its fat body towards me, I became still, watching. It got close enough to touch, but I didn't dare move. I let it dart up and steal the granola bar I had peeking out of my jeans pocket. And it darted back under the porch and into the darkness. Instead of seeing me as food, it saw me as the one who fed it. I might have ruined this poor thing. I would need to ask about it. I drove my car into town instead of walking. I rarely needed my old junker, but kept it around just in case. I could have bought a new one. Due to how little I used this one, I saw no point. Today, I wanted to drive around looking for signs of Tully or his werewolf companion. And I did suddenly see some signs. As I got onto the nearly empty main road, I drove past a strange symbol drawn onto the road. I noticed it too late, and when I looked back, it was gone. While cruising through town, I saw flickers of more symbols that only lasted a second. I followed them until I reached the end of the main street and spotted Tully leaning against a rented car, his arms crossed. I parked and walked over to him. He didn't even turn his head towards me. I looked in the same direction to spot nothing. I copied him and leaned against his car next to him. Nice jacket. Makes you look tough. I teased. With his sunglasses and his black outfit, it made him look like some bad boy extra from a 60s musical. While he shoved my shoulder with his, still not looking over. My arm slipped. I sensed he was still angry at me for going into the woods last night. I didn't let that stop me from sticking around to bother him. So, what's up with all those weird symbols around town? Are you with your werewolf buddy? What was his name? Valak. Are you two setting up some sort of magic protection or something? Tilly stiffened beside me. He looked down, his eyebrow raised at my question. Are you just guessing or someone telling you this? Or is there someone who can tell me what's going on? Because I could just go ask them. I made a move to leave and he waved me back. My constant harassment paid off. Yes, that's what we're doing. We already covered the surrounding cabins and we're coming back from the ones across the lake when you ran into us last night. It's easier to cut through the woods to reach them than stay on the roads. Normally, supernatural creatures really don't bother humans, but in this case, we can't take the chances. When I followed his gaze again, I thought I saw a strange reflection coming off of one of the shop windows. Half a symbol flickered into sight, being drawn as I watched it disappear. It made me think about how Valak was just gone last night. If he could use magic, could he turn himself invisible? And... Invisible werewolf sounded silly, but at this point nearly anything was possible. Is Valak over there, and I just can't see him? 
I asked, pointing in front of us. Tilly nodded, confirming my theory. I gave the creature a wave unsure if he could see me or even cared if I arrived. And I was given a look by my friend over being so calm about a monster being nearby. Aren't you a little freaked out by him? He did try to eat you last night, Tilly commented. I'm not mad at him. You probably saw me first and told him to scare me because I was in the woods alone again. And it was a thought that was confirmed when Tilly looks everywhere, but in my direction. Honestly, if I didn't pull the mask off Vanek, I would have been scared enough to stay out of the woods until their job was done. I was close enough on being unaware. Tully was in the area. After Vanek disappeared, he came over to check on me, making a scene pretending he wasn't the mastermind behind the werewolf scare, because he wanted to make sure Vanek didn't curse me. Which he did. I didn't hold any grudge against the wolf. Tully, looking embarrassed they were being caught, was enough payback. Are you too hungry? I can buy you lunch from the diner. I offered. I'm fine, but Vanek can always eat. I risked leaving him for a bit, hoping that feeding Vanek would make up for traumatizing him. He did scare me first, but I felt as if I did more mental damage to him. The dogs couldn't eat onions, so I avoided those and bought a few sandwiches off the lunch menu to bring over. Until he had a move from his spot, and I saw a glimmering painted circle where I'd write in now on the road. Why it faded like the others. A place to take out containers on the hood of his car for Valak to grab. I couldn't see him, so wasn't sure what a wolf was. Can everyone see those? I pointed in a direction of the now very faintly visible circle in the road. No. Because you've come across supernatural things, your eyes are adjusting to them. But, as you're able to see unnatural things, they are able to see you. I cannot protect you from everything. So stop sticking your nose in this business. But I want to know. I'm bored. I might have sounded like a child then, but it was the truth. I'd improve the internet at the cabin, but why watch shows about Supernatural when you had strange agents going on adventures where you lived? He shook his head towards me, and oddly enough, didn't dismiss me outright. I'll tell you some of what we're doing so you don't go looking and getting hurt. Now, we Valak don't eat the styrofoam. The conversation was derailed for a moment because the wolf decided to try and eat what I'd brought, containers and all. Well, at least he listened and spat them back out. Uh, as I was saying, we're here because of the harvest moon coming up. And there is a tribe of uh, Valak species that go feral during this time. The yell of the tribe isn't affected and they get the rest back to their senses after the night ends. Now, for some reason... Two of the members disappeared, and were seen around here. Well, if they don't get treated by the Elder, they succumb to the Harvest Moon fever, and we'll need to kill them before they harm anyone. First caterpillar monsters are now feral werewolves. My life had become strange since coming to the cabin. Not that I minded too much besides the nightmares. I'm surprised you're telling me this much and not pulling the hole. This is a top-secret government business. If I told you, I would have to kill you. I don't care about giving away government secrets. What are they going to do? Fire me? It's my family I can't talk about. You brought up a good point, and after seeing him living through being locked inside a monster's jaws, I didn't think anything the government could throw at him would do any harm. I understand his position because of the huge fight with my father, and knew how painful it was to talk about family if he didn't want to. The reason behind his secretive nature could be emotional. Oh, that reminds me. Why did you leave that raccoon creature behind? He's yours now. If I brought him back, he would have been torn to pieces by my other brothers. Well, the way he phrased that made me pause. I could have assumed he meant the other agents would kill the raccoon creature, but it sounded like he meant the other sleeping bag monsters would do it. And that implies his brothers were not only human agents, but also those caterpillar monsters. Hands included. Wait, you're all brothers? All of you? Hands and those things? Not just the agents? Are you trying to judge us based on human standard? Tilly commented back in an easy tone. I honestly could not tell if he had the driest of humour or was teasing me. I understood he wasn't human, but it was hard to believe him, and what was now living under my porch came from the same parent. If I asked him to explain it, he wouldn't. I just needed to accept facts, no matter how it bothered me. I don't know how I feel about it. 
having your brother as a pet. You shouldn't have to feed him, then. Well, I walked into that one. I walked into a lot of his comebacks. I looked over to see if Valak was done eating and if I needed to clean up the containers. The wolf did it himself. While we spoke, he had finished off the pile of food and placed the empty takeout containers in a garbage bin nearby. Actually, there is something you can do for me, Tully said as he drew my attention back to him. I ordered something to help deal with the feral wolves, if we come across them, but the one delivering them hasn't shown up yet. He lives around here, so that's why I asked him to get the supplies. Or would I know him? Maybe. He goes by Sven. I know he's often in the library. I don't want to go into town because someone may recognize me as one of the agents that show up in the summer. Oh, that's right. Darry thought you were the grandson of one of the agents he saw when my grandfather first came here. People may not think you guys are weird, but they do notice things. Well, Tilly paused thinking, trying to place the name. It wasn't a big town, so even if he came by once a year, it was easy to remember all the familiar faces. I pretty much knew everyone, and had only been around for a few months. I had an outright asked Tully how old he was, and if he agreed with what I just said, then I would know he's older than Darry. Darry, right. Well, he took over the bait shop from his father. He must have a good memory if he knew me by my face from back then. I volunteered to look out for a lost boy and have tried to stay out of town since. I worried one of the older residents may remember me and ask questions. I didn't know if Tully was aware he'd just given me some information. I wondered about for months or if he didn't care. I also wondered about the missing boy from back then and found out nothing. Some news articles without any resolution. What happened to him? Uh, the boy, I mean. Your family didn't have anything to do with it, right? Adam, well, that's a little rude to assume we did. He told me, a little annoyed, but went on. What happened back then was a bit of a complicated story. That boy, Tom, I think his name was, was abducted and killed by a man the town thought to be a saint. When his crimes came to light, well, the townspeople didn't bother with law enforcement. They took justice into their own hands because his crimes were against children. Because of the attention Tom's disappearance received, they could not reveal the child was dead without their brand of justice being discovered. His mother and the parents of the other victimized children had agreed to stay silent. Oh, I stood, completely shocked at what I was hearing. I never would have guessed this town had such a dark past. I felt a strange dark emotion in the pit of my stomach when I thought of how many people who lived in the town might still be alive when it happened, and how many of them I talked to without knowing they held a secret. I didn't think the younger generation knew about it, or Darry. He was too young when it happened. Was my grandfather a part of it? And did he also help giving out small town justice? Or did Tully? Did my... did my grandfather? I couldn't even finish the question. What kind of a man do you see him as? And do you think it's worth changing his image he tried so hard to portray by digging up a past that would only cause emotional harm? Anyway, I really need that package. So, if you could drop by the library for me, oh, that would be great. Well, the two different tones between his two statements gave me a whiplash. I couldn't even respond for a few seconds. I wanted to ask more questions about the past, but he just made it very clear. I needed to focus on the future. Oddly enough... There was feral werewolves, and I needed to return some books anyway. I agreed with too many thoughts cluttering in my head, and I was thinking about so many other things I didn't even guess at who I was meeting. Well, he must have been expecting me. I returned my books and started to look around when I heard my name. When I looked, I recognized the man as the one who knew my grandfather and spoke to me a few months ago. I hadn't seen him since or gotten his name. I walked over and shook his hand, thanking him for speaking with me the last time. It was then that I noticed a bundle under his arm wrapped in brown paper. Is our mutual friend still staying out of town? The older man asked with a knowing look. It still took me a couple of seconds to put everything into place. You know, Agent 202? I asked, keeping my voice down, feeling as if this just turned into a secret meeting. He noticed how my eyes were darting around and guided me to the chairs we spoke in last time. No one besides the librarian was in the building that I could see. It still felt strange talking about the agents in the open after no one else knew about their true nature. Did this man? Or was he just friends with Tully? Well, the man handed me the package and it felt like a few objects were wrapped together. Unfortunately, I couldn't find what he asked for. But these are useful enough, Sven told me. 
What is it? Maybe I can. No, it's bad enough you're this involved. No need to go chasing more trouble. Although I could be blamed for telling you some information back then. I do stand by it. I felt like you should have known some of it. And it was your choice to keep going. Well, this man was the one who told me my grandfather had been caught with an agent in his youth and before he met my grandmother. Well, it was never outright said, but I was certain Tully was the agent he spoke about. Well, I did want to know, but at the same time the question felt wrong to ask. I wanted Tully to be the one to say it and not find it out by going behind his back. So, you know that uh, 202 as well. Different, right? I hinted, not knowing how to put it. Oh, I'm well aware of what he is. Adam, I wanted to tell you things to warn you away from those agents. To warn you away from that forest during that time of year. But I couldn't until you... have seen things. If I said any of this before, you would have thought I was crazy. My hands tightened around the packages as I felt my heart quicken. Sven's tongue was serious. I was about to hear something Tully didn't want me to know. Some small bits of information about his family. You've seen all those small creatures, correct? He asked and I nodded, thinking of the caterpillar creatures. Those agents are related to those monsters. They are the result of one of them being placed into a deceased human body. The creature and the human bodies fused and formed something else. Under his human faces, something no human can bear to witness. I sat listening and had to steady my hands. I thought back to all the kind gestures Tully had shown so far and wanted to doubt what I was being told. And then I thought about the new scars on his face, the ones under his chin, and how it seemed as if his face would open up from those scars. I didn't respond and Sven went on. Now think of what would happen if they used someone still alive. That is what I was, and out of a thousand of experiments, I was the only failure and the only one left alive. A thousand? Tully's parent experimented and killed a thousand people? I didn't understand how they got away with so many. But surely someone would have noticed a thousand people going missing. It only made sense if they took people slowly, over the years and from different locations. Still, a thousand felt an impossible number. The other ones that didn't make it, they killed a thousand people for something that didn't work? I asked slowly, not wanting to believe it. How has 202 been acting towards you? Sven asked with a hard-to-read expression. The question made me pause. It wasn't what I expected and I needed to gather my thoughts. Oh, he was a bit cold at first, but he's been pretty kind to me lately. Out of all those agents, he's always been the one able to show kindness. That creature inside my body did not take well and died. But it lasted a few days and I felt what it would be like if it remained. The pain... Oh, I was beyond anything I could ever describe. When it took over all of my movements, I was aware it would use my body to commit such terrible acts and I could do nothing about it. 202 knew of it, and I suffering. And so he killed all of the agents created in that way. Well, I know he shall always pick the kindest option, no matter how cruel it may make him appear. A heavy air came between us as we remained silent for a long time. The only noise was the ticking of a clock somewhere in the library. I found that I couldn't believe my friend was capable of killing so many in order to free them. And except in that fact, I knew he was the one who loved my grandfather so many years ago. If it was to save him, he would have done anything. Whatever dangers they faced back then, Tully had been the one making the hard decisions. And just how far would he go to protect me if I still kept chasing after answers? And the package I came for felt almost as heavy as the information i just received. Is that a bit much for you? Sven asked with a small chuckle to lighten the mood. <laughs> Maybe a little. I admit it with a small nod. If you keep hanging around supernatural creatures, you're going to learn sooner or later that there are things worse than death. I wanted you to find out in a safe environment. The older man said and he started to get out of his chair. He gave my shoulder a comforting squeeze as he passed by. Take care of yourself. That's the only thing we ask for. Well, it's up to you to decide what that means for you. I watched him walk away leaving me with so much to think about. I wanted to know so much but didn't know how to handle it when I did find them out. I 
couldn't wait for too long. I needed to go back to Tuli and get the package in his hands. I passed the empty front desk, glad that no one overheard our conversation. When I found Tuli, he clearly had finished his task and was just waiting for me to get back. He sensed I was filling off, but I couldn't bring myself to tell him what I'd heard. Well, he wasn't disappointed in the fact Sven delivered different items than asked. My friend was even nice enough to wait and see if I had any questions for him. I didn't entirely feel like asking anything at that moment. And I was left behind with the same warning I'd heard so many times before. Stay out of the woods and stay out of trouble. When I arrived home that day, someone was waiting at the cabin. I blocked his number so he resorted to seeing me in person. My father arrived trying to talk me into selling the land around the cabin. He phrased it as talking some sense into me, and I was in no mood to speak with him. And that does not excuse how I acted. I don't remember how our conversation went before it turned into a yelling match. He accused me of being stupid and selfish. I would admit sometimes I was one of those things. I did not try and de-escalate the situation, and I refused to sell the land to be ruined by ugly buildings and the small town over run by rich vacationers that didn't care how they treated a forest around them. My fire was so explosive, he did something I never thought he could. He hid me. The silence after the impact was so intense due to how loud we'd been a split second before. The slap wasn't even that hard and didn't leave a mark on my cheek very long. The fact that he would raise his hand hurt more than any physical damage he could inflict. Neither of us spoke. He turned on his heel, either still angry or ashamed of what just happened. Without any doubt, he blamed me for the fight. For the rest of the day, I didn't think about the supernatural creatures or looking for answers. I didn't think about much. I just tossed food under the porch piece by piece, watching the raccoon creature I needed to name vacuum the bits. Agents in the Woods Harvest Moon Fever Part 4 Let's get straight into that. I woke up feeling sorry for myself and my mood did not improve throughout the day. Some missed calls from my mother but no messages from my father. My uncle sent a message through the only social media account of mine he knew about, basically blaming the entire blowout on me. I didn't know what my father told everyone when he arrived back home and I blocked everybody's number but my mother's and my sister's. I wasn't ready to listen to my mother, but didn't feel right cutting her out. And my sister. Well, she was in her own little world with nothing to do with what was going on around her. I wished she could give me some lessons on that skill of hers. I wasn't hungry that morning, but my fat new pet was. And taking some freezer burn meat out, I looked for him. I didn't even know if he could eat it, but until I got back from town, it was all that I had left. Some scraps of paper fluttered on the porch after I opened the door. I followed the small trail, trying to piece the note together. The scraps disappeared under the porch and only had a fraction of the paper. My only assumption was Tuli left me a note on the door and my creature tore it to pieces, thinking it was some food. And a fat little thing came out to steal the meat I put down, packages and all. Well, I gave up on the note, unable to decipher the message. And because I was buying extra food, I took my car again. I noticed some fade symbols around town. They didn't show up when I took a photo of them with my phone, and people walked without glancing at them. I was the only one who could see them besides the two who had put them there. I made a quick grocery trip, and then went around town looking for my agent friend. I came up empty-handed. I looked everywhere, all through town, by the lake and down the dirt roads. I even asked Gabby if anyone odd came into the diner that day. Well, she didn't, and the librarian didn't know where Sven lived or his number for me to call him for questions. My mind went back to that note. It might have been information on where to meet him that day. It most likely was his old warning about staying out of the woods. I looked up on my phone when the harvest moon would be. Tomorrow night was when two feral werewolves, or whatever they wanted to be called, would be in the forest. Well, at least the residents would be protected. The nights were cold, so there wasn't anyone camping so late in the season. No one should be in those woods besides two monsters and the two sent to deal with them. I spent the rest of the day cleaning and pacing, unable to think of anything better to do. 
I couldn't find Tulian, even if I did. I wasn't of any help to him. I just wanted to hang out with my friend. And after cutting out nearly my entire family, I needed someone to talk with, besides the fat raccoon creature who only stayed around for food. I could have gone into town and talked with the locals, but it wasn't the same. We were friendly, but I couldn't tell them what was going on in my life. I didn't even want to unload my troubles onto the strange agent. His job was so interesting, it made me forget about what I was dealing with. A day passed by of nothing interesting. When night came, I repeated my previous mistake. I went into the woods, chasing after that raccoon creature. In my defence, I was now very emotionally attached to it, despite not giving it a name yet. It was late and I was about to turn into bed when I heard a desperate scratching at the front door. I had locked it, but not the back one, just in case the raccoon wanted to come in from the cold. If he kept stealing things from the fridge, I would need to think of a better system. I opened the door and it rushed inside, frantic. He started to do tight circles, small hands clicking against the hard wood. I was aware he could talk, but hearing him do it was still pretty frightening. As it went in circles, it just kept repeating the same word over and over again. Danger. My outside was dark, but I didn't see any threats. No figures in the woods, and no odd sounds. Yet something had freaked out this creature enough to come and get me. I help. I stopped going in circles and ran outside. For having short arms, it sure could go fast. My heart sank as I couldn't do anything to make him stop. And still, in my sleepwear, I grabbed my jacket and threw it on. The baseball bat was missing, and being so sick, I couldn't remember where I dropped it. I'd also lost my flashlight, but made the wise choice to buy a few backups. And grab any extra flashlight off the table by the front door, I went after the creature, calling for it to come back. My other plan was to only take a few steps inside the woods looking for it and then turn back. But in my frantic worry, I took more than a few steps. I no longer could see the cabin and got hopelessly lost. Clutching my jacket close, I strained my ears, trying to find the creature. Hey, little guy, where are you? Uh, let's go back. I shouted for him, unable to stay calm. If Tully and the friendly werewolf were in these woods, they might hear me. But instead of staying still, I kept pushing on, looking. I never should have gone after him a second time. But I wasn't looking for answers. I was looking for Tully's brother. He trusted me to take care of him, and I wasn't about to let him get hurt. Considering what choices I make, it's a miracle I live for so long. I walked for an unknown amount of time, calling out at random. Hearing twigs snap behind me, I turned around while walking backwards. It didn't take a werewolf to nearly kill me. I did that all on my own. My foot slipped, taking my body down a sharp slope I didn't see in the dark. I stumbled down too shocked to even yell out. My ankle caught on a root and twisted painfully. And something at the bottom of the incline was hard and met my head in a very rude manner. I literally saw stars and got knocked out for a short while. When I came to, my head pounded and ankle throbbed. I was freezing cold because where I ended up was in a small puddle. The pain kept me down for a while. My flashlight shining in my face and making my headache much worse. But I couldn't bring myself to move my hand to push it away. While I stayed there, I heard a voice I knew. The raccoon creature was nearby, and this time he was repeating, hurt, in a small panicked voice. I started to sit up and regretted it. Then I very faintly heard Tully's voice speaking with someone, but only the end of what he was saying. Fine. He's so small and beneath anyone's notice, he can be in the woods. Are you sure your barrier worked? I asked him to get me if Adam needs help. I groaned and finally sat up. It would have been nice to know beforehand that the little guy could be in the woods without being in any danger. If a certain person told me that, I would not be in the position I was now in. A powerful beam of light came over me, and I raised a hand to block it out. Valak, get him, please. In the next few seconds, a massive wolf came down the slope. It had the white fabric covering its eyes, and I assumed that this was Valak, but in his other form. Transforming back was as simple as standing up. Well, he was there to help, but I still feel a little bit of fear from having a massive monster towering above me. 
I was lifted up in a large clawed hand and on top of the slope in another second. I was placed in front of Tully, who lowered the flashlight. My face felt hot from shame. I was thankful they'd found me, but after everything I was not ready to accept his disappointment in my actions. How many times do I need to tell you to stay out of these woods? You could have been killed. Tully snapped and found myself becoming defensive. Well, so what? It's not as if anyone would actually care if I did. I regretted the words the moment they came out. The idea was stuck inside my mind for a while, but until they got spoken out aloud, I heard how false those words were. Valak was on all fours looking like a dog stressed because his owners were fighting. You do. My only close friend had looked furious over my lack of self-preservation. He turned away, unable to meet my eyes, as he added in a lower tone, You do have someone. We stood in the dark woods, unable to speak with each other. Guilt was eating away at my stomach. I... I wanted to say something, but the words wouldn't come naturally. I saw the raccoon come into the woods. I was worried about him. A little guy watched the scene for a bit, satisfied that everyone was alive. He turned tail to head back home. I don't know how to deal with you humans, Tudy said, mostly to himself. Valak, please do me a favor and get Adam home. Well, the beast hesitated. I started to limp off and was stopped by Valak cutting off my path. He nodded his large head and Tuli wide as he lifted me up onto the wolf's back. His dark fur was long enough for me to hold onto if I lost my balance. I looked down at my friend, not knowing what to say to him. He didn't return my gaze and simply started to walk further into the woods to continue his job, and Valak started to carry me back home. Well, the wolf knew the way, which was good because I had no clue where I ended up. I silently sat on his back swaying with his steps, and the trees passed us by. After a few minutes, I started to feel myself get a little angry about how Tully treated me. Reasonably, I shouldn't. My head was clearing up, but I was still sore and wanted to be angry at someone. He didn't need to snap at me, you know. It's his fault I'm even out here. How was I supposed to know that little raccoon was safe in the woods if he barely tells me anything? It's not as if that's a question. I can think to ask the little guy. When the wolf stayed silent as he navigated us through the trees and bushes. I wasn't expecting him to answer. He could understand what I was saying, and that much was for sure. I just wanted to vent and didn't have anyone in my life that I could do so with. It's not as if I didn't try to make friends or attempt to listen to Tully's go-get-married advice. The town was so small there was just not a single unmarried woman my age. The only single girls around here were in high school, and I was not the type of person to date someone so much younger. Just thinking about it, made my skin crawl. I would have been happy with her. Oh, don't worry, Adam. Just fighting some bad werewolves. Be done this week. How about we hang out after and talk? But no, nothing. In a few short minutes that I was rambling, Valak found his way back into the trail. We were almost out of the woods and back to the main road. To get back to the cabin, we needed to cut through town. No one would be awake and I really couldn't explain riding a wolf if someone did spot me. Insane, I forced myself to let go of my frustration. I'm sorry, I don't know why I'm telling you all of this. I know some of this is unreasonable on my part, and even if you did agree with me, it's not as if you're going to give me advice. What are you going to do, give me a supportive arf? I sighed again and looked up at the sky. Countless stars glittered against the dark backdrop. And being so far away from light pollution made it so the night sky shone clearer and brighter than I'd ever seen it. Valak turned his head slightly, his hidden eyes looking over towards me. Arf! I looked down, my skin prickling. Tit, the werewolf just talked back to me. That was meant to sound supportive. Valak answered in somewhat perfect English. He had some sort of accent that was hard to place. Maybe due to how hard it was to speak with rows of sharp teeth in the way. Now my mouth dropped open a little bit when I heard him. I don't know why I never thought he could reply back. I'd never heard him speak and just assumed that he couldn't. Why haven't you ever talked before? I asked, dumbfounded. I am shy. He admitted, turning his head back towards the road. 
We continued in awkward silence as I heard his clawed feet make their way down the dirt road and towards town. I wondered if I should apologize for my wrong assumptions when we spoke again. I understand your frustrations. You are only human, after all. He told me, and it was very strange hearing words come from a mouth of a beast. What does that have to do with anything? I asked a little bit of my bitterness, coming back. Please listen to me for a short while. Valik asked politely, and I settled in for whatever he had to say. That agent may look human, but he is not. He was born and raised in a world different from your own. Us creatures of the night use favors as our currency. And due to this, nothing is free. Our time, our words, and our names all have a price. Not only is he trying to understand how freely you give things to him, he is trying to understand the concept of the word friend. We do not have friends. After all, a friend is a person you love and give too freely, is it not? I nodded, agreeing on his definition of a friend, but I didn't understand what he meant by giving truly things. As far as I could remember, I hadn't really given anything. Half a beer at one point, but nothing more than that. I don't remember giving him anything, though. Nothing, really. Maybe a nickname, and that's about it. Valak paused, and his head turned. I wondered how he saw what his eyes always hidden. A smile crossed his face. It was a little unnerving to be able to see all his teeth as he spoke. A name? You were the one who gave him a name? How very special. The wolf made a small sound almost like a laugh and started to walk again. We started to head down the main street, passing by the store windows I saw my reflection in the glass, and feeling a bit surreal over being on the back of a massive wolf. I know you're both not human, but how could a nickname really mean that much? What was his name beforehand? 202, was it not? This man, this agent, was a number. Just a creature of many brothers created to do a single job. He does not own anything. His life gifted to him by his parent. His time devoted to another. Receiving a name means becoming someone else. He is no longer 202, but rather what you have called him. Having a name and having a friend is an adjustment. Well, I felt my face flush a little and blended on the sudden cold breeze. Never would have thought the simple act of giving someone a nickname would be so important. Never wanted to force Tilly to really change, only to have a more normal life. I was seeing it all from a human angle without considering that he wasn't. Still, he could at least tell me what's going on. I said, still trying to defend my paper-thin defense over getting angry with him. Answers are not free, not in our world. Information is the second most powerful thing to us. He has not told you anything in fear that it will cost you very dearly. I found myself nodding and understood. I was being unreasonable, and a werewolf was calling me out on it. What's the most powerful thing, if you don't mind me asking? We were making a good pace back to the cabin because of his long strides, and we would be back soon, and I would no longer have someone answering some questions. I needed to use my time wisely, but this one, I just slipped out. Love. I was not expecting that answer. I looked down at Valak, never thinking that monsters would even know about the concept, let alone hold it in such high respect. Love? Well, that's a bit... surprising. I mean, just... just based on what sort of creatures I've seen, I wouldn't think they could care about that sort of thing. Love is easy for us, and that is what makes it dangerous. It makes us want to do favors for others because we love them. It makes us easily to be taken advantage of. It destroys the system that works so well for us. For example, I am taking you home right now, instead of doing my other tasks for the night. Again, I was taken aback and felt color come into my face. I had to be hearing this wrong. 
There was no way a creature I'd barely spoken with was so open about its feelings towards me. You mean, it can't be. We barely spoke, and I've never done anything for you. We finally made it back to my dark cabin. I wasn't able to get down on my own, so Valak lined himself up against the wooden porch so I could slide off his back and into the top step with a minor pain in my ankle. When I was standing on my feet again, he rose up, no longer in his wolf form, but rather on two legs, and looked down at me. Even after his friendly tone and giving me a ride back home, Valak was a bit frightening. Yes, small human, I do love you. For the simple fact you did not shun me after you saw my eyes. I looked at him confused. Why would I? You are human and would not understand. Regardless, they are shameful. Well, he was right. I didn't understand. My ankle was starting to bother me, but I could easily ignore the pain for a while. You're right. I don't get it. It is a long and dreadful story. I have time. After everything that happened that night, I did just want to go to bed, but the urge to know more about the monster before me was greater than a need to get washed up and sleep. Valak smiled at me and my answer, showing off his countless teeth again. It has been said that the father of all of our tribes married the sixteen original beasts of this world. We are the descendants of their children. He loved all of his children so dearly and wanted to give them the best of this world. In that age, the night sky shone with so many stars. It was almost as if you could not see the blackness of the night. Our first father coveted those lights. He stole them from the sky and placed them into the eyes of his children. However, we became ashamed of the act instead of thankful. And when we die... The beauty of our eyes dies as well. It is a sin to make such gems able to perish. I listened to his tale patiently, wondering if such a thing was true or not. It sounded like an old fairy tale and pretty far-fetched. But monsters were real, so who knows? Maybe this story was too. Did that really happen, or is this a legend that's been passed down? I asked amused. It is what my family has always told me, and due to that it became my truth. We have always hidden our eyes, feeling they are a burden of a past sin. And that is related to what I am getting at with the agent. His family truths are his own. You must forgive him for keeping things hidden. It is simply his nature. I thought about all the things I'd learned so far and how irrational I'd been acting because of emotional stress. I would need to apologize to Tilly when I saw him next. I was really just butting into his job and covering it up by saying I was worried about getting him hurt, which I was, but it didn't excuse my actions. Valak let me think and started to dig around through a small pouch he had attached to one leg. Besides his hood, he didn't wear anything else. It was black and blended into his fur, so I didn't notice it at first. We should have gotten you a doctor, but I believe your injuries are slight. Here, take this. It can heal you. He placed a small piece of folded paper inside my hands. I looked it over and was about to start opening it when he stopped me. There is a powder inside. Put it in some water and drink it when you get into bed. You shall sleep right away and for at least nine hours, but all of your wounds can be healed. My tribe is known for making medicine such as this, and it can be used on humans as well. It can heal injuries, but not illness, he explained. I really shouldn't be taking mystery magic powder from a werewolf, but it was that or risk going to sleep with a concussion. Valak was my friend, so I could trust him. Any other magic werewolf I would need to be wary of. Uh, thank you for this, sir. I'll try not to cause any more trouble, I said, letting my face drop. Ho oh, ho, you shall be causing more trouble. It is who you are, I can tell. But we are fine with that. We like who you are. Valak gave me another smile filled with teeth that 
didn't scare me as much as before. Oh, uh, did you guys leave a note on the door earlier? One asking me to meet you somewhere, maybe? I asked because it was bugging me all day. A note? Oh no. The agent wanted to avoid you until the threat had passed. It was a charm to keep creatures out of your house in case something got through the first barrier. And since it is no longer on your door, I assumed your little creature removed it. He is a hybrid, natural and unnatural. He could have entered, but it may have given him a slight shock. It is possible the little creature disliked it and destroyed the charm. Oh, that made sense. Tilly had a talent for ghosting me, for perfectly good reasons. And he would also want the cabin to have extra protection. If the little creature didn't come back to save me, I would have been angry at it. And the little guy said there was danger in the woods and rushed off. Did you guys come across something? At this question, Valet looked a little embarrassed. Ah, yes. Oh, well, no. We have not seen any wolves yet, but... That does not mean they are not out there. I set up traps. One that hooks around the ankle and hangs the victim from a tree. It makes a loud sound only supernatural creatures can hear, so we know when the trap has been sprung, and we do not wake up the ones in the caverns. The issue was I set it to only activate when a member of my species steps on them. I forgot to exclude myself. That is the problem with spells. If you are able to think around the wording, then they become useless. I wanted to laugh, but kept it in. And after all of my own mistakes, I really could have made fun of Valak for his. I could have drowned in a shallow puddle, and Valak got caught in his own trap. No wonder Tilly was so frustrated tonight. I let Valak go after taking up far too much of his time. I changed out my dirty clothing and took what my new friend had gave me. A few seconds passed, and I wondered how long it would take for me to get to sleep. And then I was asleep for the next ten hours. Agent in the Woods Harvest Moon Fever Part 5 Let's get straight into that. When I woke up, I found my ankle wasn't as sore as I thought it would be. Stiff for oversleeping, but my head was fine and ankle had healed up. I didn't eat much the previous day, so I wanted to make a big breakfast. Opening the fridge, I saw it was yet again vandalized. All the eggs were stolen as I slept. I didn't feel like cooking that much anyways. I could just go into town and get something to eat at the diner. However, when I opened my door, I was greeted by Tuli on the other side, hand raised as if he was just about to knock. He took a step back when a door opened, suddenly at a loss for words. How long had he been standing outside my door, trying to work up the courage to knock? I'm sorry for snapping at you last night. I should have made sure you got home instead of Valak. He explained, unable to look in my direction, even with sunglasses on. I deserved it. And Valak is pretty nice if you can get past all the teeth. Do you want to come in? I started to move out the way to let him inside, but... He backed up as if he just came across a dangerous wild animal, and just being able to see inside the cabin was a bit too much for him. No, uh, I'm fine out here. He looked unsure what to do with his hands. It was the most flustered I'd ever seen him before. Adam, listen, are you going to keep going into the woods to try and figure out what's going on? No, I lied. I could tell his eyes narrowed at me from behind his sunglasses. I didn't mean to lie. I honestly wanted to be good and stay out of the trouble, but we both knew I just couldn't stay away if a friend was at risk. Plus, it was so frustrating being in the dark all the time. This is a very important question, one you need to consider very carefully. To add to his serious tone, he removed his sunglasses to stare me down with his dead eyes. I felt a weight start pressing down on my shoulders from the stress of the suddenly tense air. Do you want help? I was so taken aback from his question, I didn't answer for a few seconds. What do you mean? As in, help you with the job? I asked slowly as he nodded, confirming it. I suddenly started to feel excited. Yes, it would mean risking my life, but I may finally get the answers I was looking for without blindly grasping 
at straws. Listen, I, I don't want to put you in danger, but I know you're going to go into the woods anyway, and I would rather be around supervising you, if that's the case. I cannot tell you that much of what is going on because it is not your place to know. However, I'll tell you what I'm able. I was ready the moment he offered, and I quickly closed the door behind me. He raised both hands, stopping me from rushing down the stairs. Ah, don't be in such a rush to get in trouble. It worries me. I won't need you until later this evening, so I'll come by again before the sun starts setting. Another reason why I'm asking you for help is because I was lent another item for this job. But I can't touch it. Humans have no issue, though. I looked at him puzzled and wondered what such an object could be. I expected a weapon of some sort. Instead, he pulled out a small wooden box from his jacket pocket. He paused before removing the lid. And what was inside made him turn his head away, unable to keep his eyes on it. It was a simple roll of stiff stained ribbon. So dark red it almost looked brown. I didn't know why it would make him react the way he was. I got only a few seconds to look, and he snapped the lid closed, acting as if the thing was cursed. And for all I knew, it could be. Well, that doesn't look too important, I said, holding my hand out to take it from him. Instead, he placed it back into his pocket. I can bind any creature. Touching it hurts like hell, so it should be a good defense for you. Valak said he was making you a charm and will be done by nightfall. Now, yeah, because the ribbon is so vile, I don't want you holding on to it until it's needed. And judging by his reaction, that was true. I wanted to know what made the ribbon so special, but at the same time, if it was something that made even him turn away, the answer may be too much for me. So, what's the plan? Track down some werewolves and send them home? I asked, trying to figure out what exactly the job was. By the time night falls, it will be too late. They need treatments before and after tonight. If they don't, we must kill them. They'll always remain feral and in a state of harvest moon fever. I don't like the idea of being forced to kill them, but for their honor and the sake of saving others that they may harm, it must be done. Not tracking down and possibly killing two feral werewolves. That part of the job hadn't changed since I asked last, but something was bothering me. Why are they here? Did you ever find out? I assume they're aware of what happens if they're too far from home tonight. So, why here? What's worth risking their lives over? Until he paused and thought over my question. It was something he considered and yet didn't have an answer for yet. I've been thinking about that this entire time. Haven't been able to find any reason why those two would be here. The whole thing is strange, to say the least. They have no links to the area. I thought back to the hundreds of hours watching crime shows and started to go through the list of questions they normally asked. I'm sure Tilly had already gone through all of these questions in his head, but I asked anyway. Or well, who saw them last? Well, maybe one of their tribe members, no. I offered. And Tilly shook his head trying to stop the line of questioning before it got too far. I don't know who it was that last saw them. I was told they were missing and were spotted here. I haven't spoken with the tribes directly. I took the job and headed over here. And since then, we found signs and are certain they're still in the area, but haven't been able to track them down. Why, well, it's easy to stay hidden with magic. Valak is trying his best, but there is two of them, and I am no good at magic. I use the basic stuff, but mostly called in to do the physical damage. Well, Valak did say information is pretty powerful. Or is there time to ask about their last known whereabouts? Maybe they told someone they would be here and then be back before nightfall today. This could have been just a huge misunderstanding. Well, I'm not going to dismiss your ideas, but this one is sort of... Well, Valak walked into his own trap. Do you think these two just forgot to leave a note before going away for a bit? Tilly stopped and slowly nodded. He realized it was possible that these two wolves just went off and forgot what kind of commotion it would cause. I'll ask Valak to send a note asking around for... Any information? I almost felt as if I'd helped out a little. I really wanted this to be some mistake and we really didn't have to track down and kill those two. If they were anything like Valak, it felt like a waste. And on cue, the large wolf appeared from thin air. Tilly walked off the front step to go over towards him, 
but I stayed on the porch. He asked Valak if he could send a message out getting any information about the two missing wolves. Well, he was told that it was possible, but the message may not come back until later, due to there being some sort of long feast between the tribes set up by the tribe of many tales. Turns out Valak's father was the one who was meant to be the one on this job, but ducked out because of the party. His son was weaker, but good enough. When Tilly confirmed that I would be coming along to help, I swore I saw Valak wag his tail a little. Because you're the only human in the woods tonight, you'll be a big help. If we don't find them before they go feral, they'll go right for their main food source, which will be humans. The rest in the tribe are being protected, so they should head straight for us. Valak explained and did not make me feel all that great. So, I'm the live bait. Thanks for that. I commented back. You're welcome, Valak said, not aware of my sarcasm. Tilly did not look very happy about the idea, but it really was the best plan we had. And so far they had no luck tracking down the wolves. I would gladly risk my life if it meant this job went quicker and before anyone else could get hurt. They were about to leave, but Tilly stopped himself. He faced me in case I had anything else to add. We'll, uh, we'll pick you up later if we don't find them today. Until then, rest up, eat something. Do you have any questions related to the job before we go? I thought for a few seconds. Well, it wasn't related to the job, but I wanted to ask this since he had mentioned it. What kind of basic magic can you do? I asked Tuli. I couldn't picture him casting spells. He looked like a guy who trusted firearms, but I'd never seen him with one. And with a complete stone face, he did something I never would have seen coming. Make eye contact. He did the slider hand that made it appear as if he was pulling off one thumb and putting it back on again. A very basic trick that would only fool a child. I held back a burst of laughter from him being so serious about it. Valak was on all fours and he started to walk around the agent, totally interested. How? How? How are you doing that? The wolf's innocent tone made me lose the giggles I held in. Any stress I had about the previous few days and the idea of doing a dangerous job disappeared from that one gesture, or at least for a little while. The rest of the day was getting ready for the night ahead. I was jittery over the idea of it all and found it hard to eat. I needed to have some strength, so forced a big meal down. I wanted to get more sleep before we left and found that impossible. I didn't have any weapons, so I grabbed my last backup flashlight and waited on the front porch for those two to come and get me. When they arrived before sunset, I could tell yet again they didn't find the wolves they had been searching for. and I just needed to do one last thing before we left. Then my raccoon hybrid came out when I set down something for him to eat, and carefully I started to pet his back, scared he might snap at me. His body felt strange, like a sack of warm fat wrapped in fabric. Well, it was a little unpleasant, but I got over it pretty fast. If I don't come back in a day or so, you can eat everything in the house, okay? But then you need to go find a new place to live. And if I don't come back soon, it means, well... I'll never be back. I told the creature, not even sure if he fully understood what I meant. I help, he replied in his little voice, and I shook my head. He started to pace upset over my refusal. Oh, it's too dangerous tonight. Guard the cabin for when I come back. That's your job, okay? But if I don't, you know what to do. Oh, it was hard parting from him. So far, he was the only one I needed to tell I was leaving. The townsfolk won't miss me too much if I never come back. Or they would just assume I packed up with the money my grandfather left me. Tully and Valak waited for me until I was done saying my goodbyes to my chunky little pet. I had faith in them, completing this job, but not in myself. I was a human, after all. I didn't think I would be of much help, if any, tonight. All I could do was try. And Valak came over to me to give me my charm. He said that it would protect me from magic. It was a very small fabric bag hung from some rope. It felt important, and I was glad to have it. And the woods looked extra threatening as we walked towards the trees. I gripped the new charm in my hand for good luck and felt a small round object, almost like a marble, inside. Whatever happened, I would need to get out alive. My family may be glad to get rid of me, but I now had friends who wouldn't. And I was going to return home 
for them. Agent in the Woods Harvest Moon Fever Part 6 Let's get straight into that. Any courage I had had left me the moment we walked into the woods. I pointed my flashlight around, jumping at any noise I heard. Valik noticed how tense I was and offered to let me hold his hand. I almost took him up on his offer. He walked behind me until he walked in front. Well, there were two feral werewolves out somewhere in the woods. I was a tasty meal for them and my bodyguards were fine with me making noise to get their attention. And we walked for a while when I started to feel sick from stress. And shining my flashlight over into the bush, I thought I noticed a dark shape through the trees. There's something over there, I said in a low voice. I don't see or hear anything. Tully was dismissing my concerns, but I didn't even notice his words. The figure I noticed stood up. On all fours, it came charging towards our small group, knocking aside bushes and kicking up dirt. For some reason, Tully and Valak acted slowly. At the last moment, I felt an arm wrapped round around my waist as Valak pulled me aside. Massive jaws came over Tully's arm as the beast tried to shake it off of him. I can't see or hear it, Adam. Is this the wolf we are looking for? Valak had placed himself between me and the creature. On all fours, he stood ready to protect me if the feral beast came in our direction. One of them, I answered back, my hands shaking from fear. I looked over the creature that still had my friend caught in its sharp teeth. Instead of a hood, it had strips of torn fabric wrapped over its eyes. Countless scars covered a wolf's body and it was missing an ear. The thing was practically foaming at the mouth as it thrashed my friend around like a ragdoll. Charms around the wolf's neck glimmered in my weak flashlight. My hand flew to the necklace charm that Valak had gave me. He said it protected me from magic. And could those charms make it so Valak and Tilly couldn't see the creature? Until he gained back the lead in a fight, he couldn't see what was biting him, but he didn't need to. He slammed a kick into the creature's stomach. The force was so intense I felt a wind come from the impact, and the feral creature spat out his arm. His arm now free, but looked as if it was barely hanging on. And through the pain, he was focused on the beast before him. Blood poured from his wounds, soaking the dirt below him. Soaking his good hand, he splashed blood all over the creature that was still trying to recover from the blow. Sue it. Valig ran out in front of me, and Tully jumped backwards to let the wolf take its spot. In one swift movement, Valig took a small flask from the pouch on his leg and took a swig of it. As the feral wolf charged, Valak spat the liquid forward that turned into a stream of fire when it hit the air. I raised my arms trying to protect my face from the suddenly bursting heat, a cough smelling of frost burning around us. The feral creature shook off the flames with a loud growl from deep within its chest. And judging from how poorly Valak avoided the next attack, he no longer could see the beast. He took a long cut along his side from the claws of the other wolf, and for some reason, I was the only one who could see the wolf clearly. Valak could guess as to where it was based on how he was attacked. His cuts healed quickly if they weren't very deep. He jumped around trying to stay out of reach of the invisible claws. The creature had no thoughts behind his actions. At least we could outsmart it. Reaching into his seemingly endless pouch, Valak pulled out slips of papers with symbols written on them. When the wolf attacked, he slapped the papers on the beast. They burned up, and I expected some sort of reaction besides that. Agent, switch with me. My magic is not working. Tully's arm still looked terrible, but he quickly switched places with Valak. My heart felt as if it was in my throat as I watched the wolf turn on the smaller agent. He landed another powerful kick that made the beast howl in pain, but then doubled down the attack in pure rage. Valley, the wolf is wearing necklaces. I said when my friend was close enough to hear. Could that be? And those terrible jaws nearly closed over Tully's neck. He sensed the movements of the air around him and got out of the way in the last second. But he wasn't looking good. The front of his shirt was torn and bloody, and he was holding his injured shoulder as it very slowly healed. I needed to do something, or else this fight would not end in our favour. If the second wolf showed up now, one of us would be killed. 
While Valak's attention was drawn away from me, I reached into my pocket to pull out the wooden box that held the rolled-up ribbon. I didn't know how to use it besides the fat creatures felt pain by touching it, and I ran forwards into the fight, and I heard a choke sound coming from Valak, knowing he didn't have time to stop me. I jumped onto the feral wolf's back with the ribbon in my hand. My plan was to wrap it around its jaws, hoping that it would help. And as I was being shaken off the beast's back, I knew I wouldn't get that far, and so I reached out grabbing a hold of the necklaces, just as the wolf reached a hand over its shoulder and grabbed me by my jacket. I tossed me aside and I flew hard into a tree. I took the necklaces with me, but the impact was so painful, I didn't remember much after I heard a cracking sound coming from my arm. And the theory was correct. When the charms came off, Tuli and Valak could see the beast. My head swam with pain, and I was unable to sit up. And from the ground, I watched Tuli pummel the feral wolf with a kick after devastating kick. So many I could barely keep up with his movements. And Valak was off doing something else I couldn't see from my angle. And finally, I heard his voice. Bomb ready! He shouted and tossed a glass vial over to Tuli. I had to have heard Valak wrong. Did he say bomb? Why would he make one of those? Why did he know how to make one? And suddenly my pain didn't matter when I saw Tuli's arm disappear inside the feral beast's mouth. At first, I thought he ate it, and then I realized Tuli shoved it down his throat while holding whatever Valak tossed to him. When Tuli pulled his arm free, something happened I didn't expect. I could handle caterpillar monsters and werewolves, but not seeing one of those monsters explode. The beast stopped for a half a second before it was just gone in an explosion of silver dust. Tuli was knocked back and Valak covered his face, trying to keep the dust from getting into his lungs. And Tuli was coughing because he had been so close when the wolf turned to dust, and he breathed so much in. I stood for a moment before my battered body collapsed back to the ground. Valak was by my side, looking over how badly I was hurt. I felt terrible and I knew my arm was broken. But it wasn't as bad as either of them. Valak's body was covered in deep gashes that looked to be healing. Tuli was making his time sitting back up from being knocked off his feet from the silver explosion. How his arm was still attached <laughs> was beyond me. That it, it exploded, I stammered. Valak, heal Adam so I can kick his ass for jumping on the feral werewolf. Tully was still on the ground, coughing between his words. It almost sounded like he was joking. Almost. And carefully, Valak took my broken arm in one hand to see how bad it was. No bones through the skin, but it felt as if the entire thing had been ripped off. Nearly all of my medicines are too powerful for humans. Well, I could give you more of the powder from before, but you'll be asleep for two days to heal this. Or... I did not like that last word. I would not like the second option, but it was the only choice if I wanted to stay helping these two find the second feral wolf. Tully sat up to come over to us, bloody and bruised, but his wounds were slowly closing up. It didn't even look as if he was in that much pain. My heart sank as I thought of how often he got hurt in the line of work for him to be so adjusted to such ghastly injuries. I could barely keep it together from a broken arm. I have this... I can heal you in a few minutes, but it comes at a cost, and I only have enough for one dose. Valak held up another glass vial and his massive clawed hands. It made the vial look extra small. It was filled with a liquid that looked very much like blood. My choices were to pack it up and go home, or to suffer through whatever the cure would bring. I'll take it, and those words did come at a cost. Valak needed to set my arm so it would heal properly before I drank whatever was in the vial. He tore off strips of Tuli's shirt who looked offended over the action to brace my arm with the straight sticks he'd found. I was told I could scream as much as I wanted but needed to remain as still as possible and to bite down on a stick so I just wouldn't bite my tongue off. I was not happy with my choices to say the least but I did everything they told me drinking down the awful tasting liquid. The stick was placed into my mouth and both of them grabbed a hold of me to make sure I would stay still. I started with heat coming from the injured arm, then a pain that felt as if every nerve ending was on fire. 
I screamed with my teeth clamped down on a stick. Both of them were not human and stronger than me. But I still fought, trying to get out of their grasp. My body wanted to move. I wanted to get away from the pain and the heat that came with it. I thought I heard my bones snap and mend together, but knew that was impossible. The entire awful experience felt like hours, and it was really only a few minutes. When the pain and the heat died down, Valak let me sit against the tree completely exhausted and starving. I'd never been so hungry in my entire life. If Valak knew this would happen and put out a bag of dried berries mixed with small bits of jerky. The bag looked too big to fit inside his pouch, but in that moment I didn't care much about where it had come from. I'm not finished healing yet, so take a break. We'll find the next werewolf once you've recovered more. Tully said. Vanek had fixed his clothing, making them look new, but I could still see scratches and cuts over the agent's face. At least I wasn't slowing them down that much. Both of them needed a bit of a break after the fight. Valak looked over. Valak looked over the necklaces I'd pulled off the werewolf, trying to figure out what magic they held. They looked to be made of bone and other animal parts. Well, it kind of grossed me out that I'd touched them. What did you give to me? Uh, to heal me, I mean. I asked between shoving Valak's trail mix into my mouth, so hungry. I wasn't tasting it. Vampire blood. Tully explained without a hint of sarcasm. He did admit that they were real, but I thought he was joking back then. He noticed how interested I was and went on. That essentially burns up your body fat, then muscle for energy to heal. It can heal back, miss limbs, however. But with enough fat to burn, you could heal a few broken bones. There is a risk if you don't have enough to use the blood. Basically, it starves you to death, trying to make your body recover. I was very glad Valak thought I had enough to bring some snacks. And looking over my now healed arm, I noticed it did look a bit thinner. That terrible, burning pain. Was my body fat being eaten up? In the past few months, I hadn't been eating as well as I should. It gave me enough fat to work with, and I was a little embarrassed both of them had looked me over to decide if I had enough fat on me to risk using the blood. Valak spoke up and distracted me from my thoughts. I am confused over these charms. I believe this one is to hide the wearer from supernatural creatures' senses. Adam is human, so he was able to see the wolf when we could not. The other is to protect the wearer from magic. The issue is their tribe is not known to make these. The tribe of the moon makes weapons, not charms. Valak destroyed the necklaces I'd stolen off the creature. It was worth the risk. The second wolf was bound to have the same type of items. I'd eaten through the bag of snacks and started towards the ribbon I'd dropped. Neither of them could touch it, and I was too tight to get it until that moment. And as I rolled it back up to place inside the box, I felt as if the thing was useless. I just wasn't strong enough to use it to bind a creature. And when I turned back to them, a blurry figure behind Tuli made me nearly drop the ribbon. I shouted a warning as he swiftly kicked whatever was behind him. I heard another crack of impact. I couldn't really see what was there aside from a vague human shape in the dark. The shape caught Tuli's kick against one arm and raised the other with an envelope in a blurry hand. I have my offer, Mr. Valak, came an uneven voice from the figure. But Tuli lowered his leg, no longer looking as if there was a threat. Valak took the envelope and the agent came over to me to explain what I'd just seen. Ah, it's just a mailman. We did ask for information about those two feral wolves, and it's just getting back to us now. Normally humans can't see them, but you've come across so many supernatural creatures. Your eyes are adjusting. Mail. Don't you have spells for that sort of thing? Yes, but spells can be worked around. When you're using a spell to receive information, your body's like a, a computer. You risk someone hacking your connection right to your body and huh, it can get pretty ugly. Having information delivered is slower, but safer. As Tilly explained the system to me, Valak spoke with the figure. He apologized for them suddenly attacking it and thanked them for the mail. I thought I'd see him slip the figure a small tip because he felt guilty Tully that he took the figure's head off. And Valak wasted no time ripping open the envelope to read the note 
as the mailman left us behind. I didn't think there was time for this. We could be attacked at any second. But I was told information is power in their world. Whatever was in that letter, or it could be important. I don't understand this. Tuli, help me. Valak admitted defeat in a few seconds. I asked the information, strange. Tuli walked over, and I joined them to look over their shoulders at the chicken scratch language on the paper. Maybe. My uncle has such bad handwriting. I can't read this. How on earth did Valak's tribe survive this long? He was friendly and a good person, but had his moments. Tuli looked to his freshly repaired jacket pocket to pull out a pair of reading glasses to replace his sunglasses. I felt a flutter of excitement in my stomach at the sight of them. I finally had something I could tease him with, but not in the middle of a job, and when a feral werewolf could come at us at any second. But they didn't want me to hear what the notes said, because they started to exchange confused words in a language I didn't know. I was a little offended by it and spoke up, knowing they wouldn't even have this information if I didn't suggest it, and they let me in on what they found out. Apparently these two wolves were last seen with the leader of the Beast of Many Tales tribe. Tilly started. Isn't that that tribe that threw that big feast all the wolves were at now? And the same tribe that made those charms? I offered, and Tilly and Valak looked at each other and nodded at my questions. What do you know about this tribe leader? His name starts with a B, right? Didn't he lose an arm recently? Tilly asked, searching his memory for what he knew. Ah, yes, that was the old leader. He married a human, an animal daughter, I think. The new leader took over but did something so terrible, his name has been removed from the world. But the tribe is unable to replace him right now. So he is nameless, and yet still the leader but I cannot think of why he would see or even bring two members of the Moon Tribe over here. For what purpose are they here? Valak said while looking at the note as if it could tell him all the answers he wanted. Uh, For a distraction, maybe? I spoke up. They both looked at me waiting for an elaboration. Well, maybe he was angry at his triumph for removing his name and knew what revenge he wanted to take would bring attention of the tribes or agents. So he, well, he made you guys go in on a wild goose chase, keeping your attention on the two wolves instead of himself. Oh, and there is something on the back of your note. Valak quickly flipped the paper over to see some more writing. They both read it over quickly, and the head shut up in a surprise over what they just saw. This time, they didn't try to hide it. The tribe leader bought a human girl, Valak said confused over the fat. That uh, doesn't sound good. Is there any, like, curses he, uh, I don't know, needs virgin blood for? Well, this idea sounded pretty mundane when it came to magic rituals. I wasn't expecting Tully's face to go pale in the dark. And Valak let out a gasp and took a step back as if he had just witnessed a train wreck. And yet couldn't believe the horrors of what he was seeing. They both clued into something terrible I didn't know about, and almost didn't want the answer. You don't think he... he would go so far to commit a Harvest Moon ritual, and the Harvest Moon fever wolves were just... being used? Valak asked in a low voice that sounded as if he was begging Tully to say he was wrong. It, uh, fits what we learned. The land here helps rituals and spells stick, so it makes sense why he would come here to do it and why he would use two moon wolves as a distraction. Tilly said as he started to fold the note to put it away with his reading glasses. Valak, please go on ahead a little to see if you can find the other wolf. I'll tell Adam what our theory is. Valak looked as if he would be sick and get it back down to all fours. He walked away, tail and ears drooping. I felt bad over mentioning the sacrifice idea. Whatever theory we'd stumbled into, it greatly upset the both of them. Let's walk and I'll explain this. I followed close behind Tilly as we walked through the dark and silent woods. He didn't look as if he could face me as he spoke, his voice low as if he feared another person would hear what he was saying. 
for creatures of the night like Valak's tribe, virgin flesh and blood is heavily sought after. Why, it's more powerful than any other flesh and blood. Don't ask me why that is. That's just how it works. The virgin blood sacrifice is popular because you can take the blood without the risk of the human dying. Having him alive to give more blood a second time is easier than finding another virgin. Sometimes the tribes that are friendly, we humans offer to buy their blood. Buying their entire body is so very rare because, well, it's seen as a crime to kill a virgin for a spell or a ritual. And a harvest moon ritual well, is much worse than that. He stopped walking to look over his shoulder to ensure I was still following. Whatever this ritual was, it was so forbidden in his world that neither of them even dared to consider someone would go through with it until I brought up the train of thought. It's not even a ritual. It's a violent assault on a virgin on the night of the harvest moon. That's it. Something so simple that it will make one committing such a terrible act become a hundred times more powerful. And yet, not even monsters will go through with this due to how unforgivable taking away innocence in such a violent manner truly is. Well, his tone was deadly serious with me. He was darting around using the one word that would describe this action. And I was all right with that. I already felt sick thinking about what the poor girl might go through tonight. And if that it may even be too late to save her. That's... I started but was unable to find the words to describe how awful it really was. I can only hope my theory is wrong. It does fit what we have learned so far. If we are right and this is what the tribe leader has planned, we still have a chance to save her. Even if he finishes the ritual... The victim doesn't always die. Valak's mother was a victim of the Harvest Moon ritual. His biological father was torn to pieces by the tribe when they found out. His mother disappeared shortly after. Valak is shunned due to his star in life, aside from his adopted father, who was kind but stupid. I'm not saying that to be cruel. He's just too dim to understand why anyone would care about another's past. I understood why Valak was so nice to me. His tribe shunned him for something he couldn't control. Aside from one person in his life, he was used to others treating him poorly for just being alive. The fact I brought him food and saw him as an equal was enough for us to be good friends. He looked so horrified at the idea of the ritual happening again because he feared another person would go through the trauma his mother did. Adam, if you didn't start questioning the reason why these two wolves are here... We never would have learned what we did. My job is to only track down the two wolves as requested. Information isn't free, so Valak would have never thought to ask. If we are able to save this girl, why well, it's because you are here. I felt my face flush a little in the dark. I didn't feel as if I'd helped at all. Asking questions just felt natural, even if I was being a bit nosy. I kept getting reminded that Valak and Tully weren't human. What felt like common sense was something they may never think of. I didn't have an answer for him, so I just shyly nodded, feeling embarrassed from receiving any sort of praise. Well, let's track down that last werewolf so we can focus on finding that girl. I replied. I started to walk forward, only to get off on the wrong foot. I tripped until he caught my hand to help keep me steady. And as we walked, I followed behind him. His hand stood in mine in case I tripped again. Like asking all of those nosy questions, it just felt natural. Agent in the woods. Harvest moon fever. The finale. Let's get straight into that. When we walked up to Valak, him and Tuli spoke in hushed tones in a language they used before. It sounded as if he was just catching up with the wolf on his theory, but it sounded as if they had a brief argument over something that I was unaware of. Tully seemed to have won, but Valak got in some last words in English. The battle before us shall be a hard one. You should not hesitate in revealing your true face, or else you will die. It was the most bitter I'd heard Valak speak before, and for once his tone matched his features. Now Tully remained as silent as a grave. Something happened between them, and neither were going to tell me. I already had so many questions answered that night I shouldn't get greedy. But I didn't feel right having those two suddenly act so coldly to each other when in the last fight they worked so well together. 
Tully did not address the topic that made them act so tense. He shifted the conversation onto finding the last feral werewolf. Is there a spell you can use to bring it over here? Asked Valak, getting down to business. No, but I can create one. Adam, I shall need a drop of your blood. Come over here. In the next few minutes, Valak started to break down the process of how magic spells worked. A lot of it was lost on me. I understood that supernatural creatures had an energy source within themselves that they could use to create or use spells. They also draw on that source to automatically heal from certain injuries. And spells were simple. First, he drew a circle in the dirt. It held the power for the spell. Then, right in around the circle, he told the magic of what it should do. He cut my finger with a sharp claw, so a few drops of blood stained the dirt in the middle of the circle. Now, apparently, someone with magic could create any kind of spell, as long as they held enough power and intention to do so. The one Valak just made amplified the smell of my blood, so if the feral wolf was anywhere within a hundred miles of us, it would come looking for the source. Thankfully, Valak also made it so the ones present with the spell was made would not be affected by it. So, we didn't suffer with the overpowering smell were trying to fight. How Valak could think of these things on the fly and yet be amazed by a simple thumb trick, I was beyond me. His spell worked, or it was clear just how well it worked when a force of nature itself came tearing through the woods towards us. The thing was three times the size as Valak. My wolf friend took over protecting me as the other dark beast came barreling towards us. It let out a snarling howl and tore the tree in its way right out of the ground. This thing possessed far more raw power than the first one. Nothing covered its eyes, showing cloudy and yet still glowing rubies. They held some beauty, but were tainted from the rage that overtaken the wolf. If I got in the middle of this fight, I was not coming out alive, unless my friends had some sort of secret weapon up their sleeves, that they might not survive this either. The broken chains dangled from the beast's arms, explaining why it did not come for us sooner. In a bind rage, it slammed massive claws into the ground, hard enough to make Tuli stumble, even though he dodged a blow. Valak had his hands full, trying to keep me safe, and was unable to hit the feral wolf with any magical spells. And Tuli and Valak could only move out the way of the deadly claws. If even a single one of those blows hit any of us, we were dead. Simple as that. Watching my friend struggling to stay alive, I knew this outcome was my fault. I should have left after the second fight and had no reason being there. Even after answering so many of my questions, Tuli was still hiding something from me. He asked to do this job because he had the power to finish it. He was not using that power because that meant fully revealing what he was to a human. I guess that was what him and Valak had a little spat about. And he was risking his life because he was afraid I wouldn't be able to handle his true face. Valak tossed me aside in time and the feral wolf caught him and his tail. And I saw my friend get tossed aside. Valak's body flew, slamming into a tree hard enough to lift it from the ground. The wood groaning and roots exposed. Here I was, only armed with a ribbon while my two friends fought against such a fearsome creature. I watched on in horror as glowing ruby eyes looked over to Tuli. He gave me a worried look as if I was the one in the crossfire. I thought I saw the scars along his face move ever so slightly in the dark. The monster charged and he raised his arms in a poor defense. And I was helpless and could only watch my friend get torn to pieces. Just before those deadly jaws closed on Tuli's arms, I heard a noise behind us. It came up too fast to see what it was before it appeared. A shape I recognized had been in my nightmares for months came tearing through the woods. The countless arms are brooding trees as it tossed them aside. And grabbing a feral wolf into some of its arms, it tossed the beast aside, leaving me and Tuli to look on in shock at our rescuer. Hans? I blurted out. The monster looked over at me pale white face being taken up by an amused smile. The wolf recovered and came straight for Hans, who was much larger than it. He took it by the scruff of the neck and started to slam it into the ground, and trees so violently, the sound of breaking bones nearly made me sick. The attack had only lasted seconds. Hans easily killed the feral monster, both Tuli and Valak had so much trouble with. And once the wolf stopped moving, Hans dropped the body to the ground looking uninterested. He curled his long body and tucked in his many arms. The fabric like texture along his body shining in the dim moonlight. Hans, why would you? 
Why would you save me? Tuli asked, sounding as confused as I felt. For two simple reasons and devastating facts, the creature answered. A smile so wide on his face, his eyes were barely open. You're my brother, and I love you. I looked between the two of them, again feeling it to be impossible that they were related at first. And the more I looked, the more it seemed like Hans was an older brother, come on in to save his younger one from a bully. Oh, it was almost touching. Aside from the fact Hans was a nightmare that ate humans to have that many arms. I cannot do more for you. Our debts are cleared. In the future, do not hesitate to reveal your true face, little brother. What does the human call you? Tuli. Hans elongated my friend's name as if he found it amusing. And Tuli didn't look offended, but rather a little bit emotional that his new name was spoken by a member of his family. Have more pride in being a child of our lord, no matter how much you hate our parent. Now go on, you have a job to do, and do not disappoint me. Hans curled his body around Tully as he spoke, and after finishing giving advice, he started to come towards me and away from the scene he'd saved us from. And just as he was about to pass by me, he dropped his voice down to a whisper. I am rooting for you, human. Hans said softly, with an honest-to-God wink. I didn't know what he meant by that. We watched as Hans left us all safe, but with some unanswered questions. Out of all the people to come and save us, I never would have guessed Hans would lend one of his many hands. He's right. We need to go, Tully said while looking at Valak. My wolf friend looked just as shocked over the outcome, but not as injured as I feared. He walked over on all fours until he lifted me onto the wolf's back because I still couldn't jump up on my own. I don't want you to be any part of this, Tully admitted. It's too dangerous. I think the tribe leader knows that we finished off the other two wolves. I couldn't tell where he was before, but now it's almost impossible not to sense his location. I fear he's already finished the ritual and no longer needs to hide, and all the more reason for you to go home. I would never forgive myself if I didn't try to help, I replied honestly. I knew I was pretty much powerless and hindering them. I also knew there was a beast down in the woods that could be hurting an innocent person as we spoke. If my friends and that person died, well, I stayed safe at home. Well, I didn't know how I would handle that. I was scared I would die that night, but I felt it was worth it if I could make any kind of difference. Any sign of trouble you can't handle when Valak will get you out of here. Tudy told me, and I felt like that wasn't true. I had an understanding with the wolf. He may care for me, but he will respect my choices. I nodded in a line till he started off first. His run started out at a normal speed, but soon enough, not even Valak on all fours could keep up with him. I heard him in front of us, but didn't see him in the dark. I felt my stomach twist in stress as I gripped onto Valak's fur, and holding on for dear life, trying not to be flung off. If I hurt him, he'd never complained, and suddenly he slowed to a stop. I didn't see any creatures or danger. I wonder why we weren't still moving. We shall catch up in a moment. This is a serious and I cannot risk truly overhearing what I am about to ask you. Valak told me in the coldest tone I'd ever heard from him. I swallowed my nervousness and listened. Please save Tuli's life, Valak said in a low voice. I didn't understand what he meant. I would do whatever I could to help without being asked, because he did, and I felt as if he had a good reason. Why do you think he's... he's gonna die? My voice was shaking when I spoke. This ritual the tribe leader is about to perform is... vile. If he completes it, he shall no longer be a creature of the night, not a beast or a human, something below even that. If Tully fights him on equal terms, it would mean he's recognizing the tribe leader as a creature like himself. He refuses to give him that respect. The agent shall fight in his weaker human form. And if he defeats the leader on those terms, there is no greater disrespect. That's a if. He's going after something that is doing a ritual to gain crazy power without using all of his own. Can't you talk him out of it? I begged feeling a little dizzy at the thought of a friend going into a useless battle. He has requested that I do not help. Using magic will be the same as giving it respect. 
I can only fight after he passes away. I am honoring this because he is my friend, and I care for him. I tightened my grip on Valak's dark fur, and he didn't react, my hands trembling, unable to steady them. That's stupid. Oh, if you care about him, you shouldn't be doing what he asked. My voice was full of tears that threatened to take over me. It is because I respect him I am doing this. I am also carrying you on my back after all. Valig replied and his voice sounded as hoarse as my own. We'd only known each other for a short time, but he'd already considered me a friend. He was suffering by watching two people he cared about rush into a dangerous situation. I was human and so powerless, and yet I was in these woods with them. I couldn't be angry at Tuli because I was doing the same thing. I'm sorry, I told the wolf and meant it. Let us catch up. Perhaps our luck shall hold and the ritual has not been completed. I wanted nothing else in the world more than that to be the case, but our luck did not hold. When Valak arrived into the clearing, we came into a dreadful sight. Tuli arrived first, a snarl on his face towards the creature in the middle of the space. Large boulders had been placed and crudely carved into a throne of sorts. In the middle was a girl belly out of her teenhood. She was covered with a ragged blanket draped over the top of her body, face bloody and bruised, blood staining the stones around her. I took all of my willpower to keep my small dinner in my stomach. I knew what had happened to her. Her eyes closed and I couldn't tell if she was dead or not. But the monster that stood in the clearing and turned to face us was massive. It towered over us, blocked out the moonlight. It looked a little like Valak when he stood on two legs, a large body covered in jewellery and trinkets. Ten tails sprouted from behind him, and they moved as if underwater. Unlike Valak, he did not cover his eyes, and for good reason. He turned blacker than night. Deadly jaws curled up in a cruel smile as he looked at us. He already completed a ritual and was looking on three creatures that dwarfed him in every way. Valak, the girl is still alive. Get her out of here. Tully said in a harsh tone, but his anger wasn't directed towards us. On it. I slipped down from Valak's back and stumbled a little, my hand going for the ribbon box, waiting to see what I could do to help. It felt like I couldn't do anything. The monster let Valak run on all fours to the girl and took her in his arms as he shifted forms. And just like that, they were gone. I tasted so many bitter emotions, knowing we arrived too late, and the tribe leader only let Valak take the girl because he was finished with her. Oh, what an honor. An agent has come to take me down. A harvest man, no less. The beast said in utter glee, every tooth in his mouth exposed as he spoke. I cannot wait to try out this new power on you. Reaching a clawed arm towards us, Tully took off running to get the monster's attention away from me. His form a blur to my human eyes. I gasped as I watched him leap up and deliver such a powerful kick to the monster's arm, I felt the shockwave from where I was standing. And Tully backed off to look over the damage he had just inflicted. The force was enough to smash the trinkets and jewelry the tribe leader wore. The ruined arm snapped back into place as the monster chuckled at the efforts. <laughs> You are going to need to do better than that. Instead of being hurt in the slightest, the wolf sounded pleased, as if he loved the idea of fighting. I was new at watching two creatures duke it out, but it felt as if Tully really couldn't win this if he carried on the way he was. And deep down I knew that Kick was all the power his human body could manage. He would need to do what Hans had told him. And I didn't know what it meant to Tully by showing his true face, but I wanted him to disregard his sense of honor and fight with everything he had in him. I couldn't even shout over to him to try and talk him out of this crazy nonsense before he charged at the monster again, delivering kicks that would be deadly to anything else, and some of the shockwaves so intense that they hurt my chest. The tribe leader's body recovering before Tully landed another attack, making it all seem hopeless. The beast moved out of the way while laughing, even though he didn't appear to be taking any real damage, and so didn't have a reason to dodge. And Tudy's long black clad leg came down on the stone throne that such a horrible act occurred on and cracked the main boulder 
in half. How could this monster stand after being hit from so many attacks that powerful? And what could I do to help armed with a simple ribbon? Tully could not get out of the way in time as a massive hand wrapped around his chest in a vice. He thrashed in vain, trying to get free. Enough of your pitiful attempts. Reveal your face for me. Fight! Fight like the creature you are, Harvest Man! The wolf bellowed down, raising Tully off the ground. I could do nothing but watch as it reached a pair of fingers towards my friend's face, and Tully leaned back as far as possible, but couldn't stop what was coming. The razor-sharp claws dug into his left eye as he clamped his mouth shut in order not to scream, and those two long nails started to open up the inside of the eye socket as if trying to stretch it. Red blood poured down his face, only to be replaced by black, inky liquid. Show me your face! Let me see why agents are so feared. The tribe leader never lost the giddiness in his voice as he tried prying open Tully's face through his eye socket. Past the gore and the black blood, I saw something. A hint of a different face under the torn flesh. Something no words could describe properly. A part of his face as handsome as it was frightening. At this rate, Tully would either die or have his entire human mask ripped off. I took a huge risk to save my friend. I never so beneath the wolf's notice that I could run over without him even looking over at me. I was unaware of how the ribbon worked and hoped my crazy idea would pan out. I tossed it over the wrist of the arm still gripping Tully, and grabbing a ribbon by both ends, I pulled with all of my might, hoping the ribbon touching the tribe leader's fur would have a negative reaction. And somehow, it worked. The beast let out a surprise yelp and dropped Tully to the ground. And I stumbled as the ribbon slipped off the beast's wrist and the powerful wolf took a few steps back from us. Tilly kept a hand over his bleeding eye and the rest of his ruined face healed over rapidly so I could no longer see any hints of what was hidden away. You do not deserve any honor! Tilly snapped at the creature. He dropped his hand, his eye closed and flesh around it badly wounded. I met his gaze and we both knew exactly what to do to defeat a monster that was out of our league. When the ribbon touched on the beast, it smoked and looked as if a small wound caused the wolf too much pain to move. Tully dashed over to the end of the long ribbon and grabbed it with his bare hand that also started to smoke. He fought through the pain, jumping and dodging a wolf's slowed movements. He looped the ribbon around the beast's neck as I held on to the other end. Claws came up to try and pry it off, and those nails could not cut himself free. And for the first time, the beast looked scared. Until he came back beside me and took the other end of the ribbon from his injured hand, and now with both ends, I pulled, the dark stained ribbon tightening on the thick furred neck. It was too late for the beast to swap me away or kill me. It frantically clawed at his neck trying to save himself. It started to take a few steps back to pull me off my feet, hoping I would let go of the noose, until he grabbed my wrists and planted his feet in the ground, and together we pulled as hard as we could the thin fabric looking as if it would snap at any moment. And as the beast started to lose ground, it fought harder than before. I was trying to fight for his life after all. My arms felt like they were about to break and the ribbon dug into my hands deep enough to cut it. I wrapped it around them a few times so I would not let go, and Tully couldn't keep us from sliding forwards. We both used all of our strength, straining against such a powerful force. We are not going to lose any more ground. Tully was behind me, and I felt his breath on my neck as he spoke. And knowing the end was near, the monster decided an attempt at one last attack, and opening his mouth, I saw a faint light starting to appear from the closing throat. I knew whatever was going to happen was going to be bad. I was risking our lives to keep pulling before the attack came at us, and I refused to stand down. Only a little bit more effort, and we would win. Just another second, I begged, arms burning in pain and I bet on that one second before the attack came and lost. A blinding light came from the tribe leader's mouth directly towards us, and where it touched, fire sprouted. I felt the heat and thanked my luck that at least I would have a quick death, but regretted I couldn't save my friend. However, the burning light did not touch us. The small bag charm Vanek had given me strained against the cord around my neck. The bag burned away, and inside was the most beautiful pearl I'd ever seen. It trembled and cracked, burning up in seconds just as the light faded, leaving small fires around us 
and the ground smoldering. I'd seen that pearl before. Valak gave me his eye and it protected us. I now understood his shame for having such precious-looking eyes. It hurt me so deeply, knowing something such as that was sacrificed for my life. Nothing with such beauty should be destroyed. And the tribe leader looked spent, smoke pouring from where his nose touched, but we were also on the end of our ropes. And both of us gave everything our bodies could handle to win one step back. I felt sweat pour from my face and I didn't know how long I would be able to stand the pain. And just as I thought we were about to give in, two large furred arms wrapped around both me and Tuli. We were crushed together and the claws started to pull us back. Valak had arrived to give us the last bit of strength that we needed. The wolf looked at us through the smoke with a hint of regret. I thought that a ribbon would cut his air supply off. I never expected we would cause such a gruesome death to this creature. His arms dropped and the ribbon tightened one last time. We all stumbled back into each other as the beast's head came clean off. The head rolled to the ground with the body following a few seconds after. All of us in a pile, we sat stunned at what we had accomplished. The ribbon ducked so tightly into my hands even after I had let go. It was stuck in my palms. It took a long time before I turned around to face my two friends, all still on the ground, too exhausted to stand up. Va- Valak, your eye, I said, not knowing what else to start off with. It was well worth it. I still felt a little ashamed, no matter how much they assured me. I would always feel guilty, both of my friends losing an eye that night. Until he sat facing me, his damaged one still closed and black blood covering half of his face. What about the girl? Is she all right? I asked, praying for good news. No, but she is alive. Valak admitted. Tilly looked as angry at himself as I felt. He cast his gaze downwards, trying to calm himself. I started to pull the ribbon out from my hands with shaking fingers. Oh, it hurt like hell, but we all made it out. Still breathing, and that was a small victory. And reaching out, Tilly took my hands to look them over. Injured palms facing up, the back of my hands in his. I felt some sort of bitterness fade. I looked him over, knowing we both felt the same thing not being able to forgive ourselves for arriving too late, but also glad that each other was alive. For once, I didn't have anything to ask him. Sitting, facing each other, we didn't need any words in that moment. A movement from behind him caught my eyes. Valak made claws into a fist and was bumping the side of his thumbs together. I couldn't decipher what he was trying to get at before I had any clue what he was miming. I heard a voice as someone walked into the smouldering clearing. I hope I'm not too late. I'm here to pick up the ribbon I lent. The newcomer was tall, looking no older than twenty. White wavy hair was cut just above his ears, and yet his bangs nearly covered his red eyes. His smile looked so kind it almost didn't question who he was, and why Valak and Tully looked so panicked when he arrived. He was cheerful at first, and then his smile turned strained and he froze, seeing the headless body. Excuse me, he told us in a cheerful tone. He walked behind a tree and I heard the wretched sounds. Seeing a decapitated corpse was too much for such a kind soul, such as himself. Uh, who is that? I asked, looking from between where I heard the puking sounds, and to my friends. He's, uh, it's hard to explain in a simple way. But he's the most powerful creature. Pretty much, a god. Tully explained, looking extremely nervous. What? It was hard to blame me for the reaction from what I just witnessed. The guy losing his dinner in the bushes was even more powerful than the monster we fought. And then the frightening creature that was Tully's parent. When he came out from the bushes, eyes red with tears, Valak darted to him to fuss over the newcomer. I'll take the head back to the tribe. They shall want their leader back and decide to kill him, or if this state is what he deserves. Valak spoke, sounded stressed. I looked over at the body of the monster and the lifeless-looking head. I simply could not believe it was still alive after all of this. These creatures were tough. At least it didn't look to be in any state to harm anyone ever again, and Valak started to draw a circle in the smoking ground around the fallen beast. The white-haired man started to roll up the ribbon 
having no issues touching it. He followed it over to us and looked like he was on the verge of tears. He looked down on us until he froze in place from fear from just being looked at. Oh, you're human. You're so brave. The newcomer dropped down to his knees to take my hands into his own, and his voice sounded watery. You must have been so scared. I'm sorry I couldn't step in and help. He followed all the rules and, and, well, that poor girl. Now I found myself wanting to comfort him, and then realized my hands were no longer in pain. When he let go of them to rub his eyes, I saw that they were fully healed, aside from some new scars. Cautious. You can't just... How many times have we told you? You can't heal people like that. It's not your job. When Tilly scolded him, his eyes started to water again. It felt like my friend was bullying this poor man. Then suddenly, he slapped out a hand and hit Tully over his injured eye. I let out a snort when the agent angrily hissed and placed a hand over where he'd just been slapped. I just told you not to heal anyone. Tully snapped again. But when he lowered his hand, his face was perfectly fine. Oops, it was an accident. I slapped the bug, came an innocent reply. You can't. I slapped a bug. My hand slipped and healed you, right? Right? I didn't display any favoritism and helped you out, right? The human was never harmed because the ribbon doesn't hurt humans, right? The man was getting closer and closer to Thule as he spoke until their noses were almost touching. He finally sounded a little bit threatening in his kind yet strained tone, giving massive hints to make Thule drop it. When the man backed off, he stood on uneven legs, and Tilly looked just as unsteady. He needed to wrap an arm around my waist for both of us to stay on our feet. Do you have the box the ribbon came in? The taller man, I guessed his name was cautious, asked and held out his hand. He reached into my ruined jacket pocket to find the small wooden box. Handing it over, the ribbon was placed inside until it was needed again. Now... This place is a mess. I will be hard to explain why the fries looks like this. It's like a media hit it. Looking around, I agreed. It was far too strange to blame the damage on a simple forest fire. The valet had finished his circle. From where he stood, he gave us a wave as the tribe leader's body and head sunk down into the ground, disappearing from wherever the wolf sent it. He went in after them, and I wondered if I would ever see him again. A clap made me jump. The sound echoed, and I found myself no longer inside a burnt-up clearing, but surrounded by tall trees. Cautious. Tilly started. Covering up the supernatural events is part of my job. This is within my rules. I looked at the trees and then at Tully's healed face. If this man had this much power, then maybe he could save that girl when we couldn't. That girl the tribe leader attacked. Could you heal her? I asked with the smallest amount of hope. Cautious had the small box between two fingers. He looked down at it as he spun it, his tone somber and not like how we spoke before. I may be the most powerful creature of this world, but that power is used to keep the balance between creatures of the night and humans. Creatures have rules, just as humans do. It may appear at first that one of the things in the dark do is unfair. It is simply because you cannot understand it. I had the power to heal that girl, but I cannot, because it would ruin the balance. You cut off the head of the tribe leader, because he harmed that girl. If she was not harmed, and I made it as if nothing ever happened to her, it would no longer be balanced. The leader would have been harmed for no reason, and then I would need to heal his injuries. And it would keep spiraling from there. If I kept fixing the world because someone was unhappy about an outcome, it would never stop. And what was the point of anything happening if I was just going to change it after? So, for everyone's sake, I did not heal you. I did not help in the slightest because that would be unfair, don't you think? Well, he stopped spitting the box as he finished speaking, his red eyes looking over at me from under banks of white hair. I felt a chill and understood why Tuli and Valak were so frightened of him. I wasn't even this afraid of Tuli's parents when I faced them. The darker tone didn't last long. He soon lifted his head to give a small smile. You two look tired. I should get some rest. This time our surroundings changed around us without a clap. 
In the blink of an eye, I was staring at the cabin. I felt dizzy and would have fallen over if Tilly wasn't keeping me upright. You really can't be doing stuff like this. Tilly warned again, sounding pretty determined to try and have cautious to obey whatever rules he was bound by. I didn't do anything. You two just, uh, walk back really fast, if anyone asks. Anyway, I need to go. And your human is going to faint from being overexposed from everything. He's that type. The cautious knew I was going to pass out before my body did. I heard half of Tuli's answer before falling into a darkness to wake up in my bed hours later. My feet felt heavy. Not only did someone put me into bed with my dirty shoes on, but didn't lock the door so the recruiting creature got inside to curl up on my legs. I looked at his plump, fat body and muttered out how much of a chunky monkey he was. I woke him up. He looked very displeased as he rolled off the bed landed on the floor with a soft plop. I heard him comment on how monkey was a good name before scurrying off. Little feet scurrying across the hardwood floor and hoping that now I was awake, I would feed it. And I regretted slipping up and calling him that. I wondered if it was too late to change his name to something else or if Monkey was what he really picked. My body felt stiff and my arms burned, but I was able to stand up. And looking outside, I could see Tully's rental car parked out front. I slowly made my way down the stairs and my muscles saw in protest at the movement. And opening the door, I saw Tully's back turned as he was walking away from the porch. Again, he could not bring himself to knock on the door. Hey! I walked across the wooden porch to follow after him. My voice made him stop and he turned to look at me. I couldn't make it down to the steps, so I leaned against the railing to look down on him instead. But he was dressed in a suit again, looking like the agent I'd met months ago. And taking off his sunglasses to talk made him appear more like a friend I knew. Are you, uh, you feeling all right? I asked, getting the first words in. I heal fast. He raised a scarred hand from where he grabbed the ribbon. Without thinking, I reached over to place our hands side by side, so our scars showed. We match. I expected him to smile or even laugh. His eyes fell on the matching scars along our palms, and he looked sad, as if such a minor thing was a tragedy. And looking up, his eyes seemed more human than I'd ever seen them. He opened his mouth to speak, but found no words for me. In that moment, I couldn't help but wonder who he was looking at. Did he see who I was, or did he see my grandfather? His gaze was so intense, I pulled my hand back. I've been wondering, what did my grandfather wish for? Uh, do you know? I am thinking it was a lot of cash. Well, the question was meant to brighten the mood, and it did the opposite. His face turned pale, and like stone. My friend changed from the Tuli back to 202. No, beyond that. Whatever happened in the past turned him into something inhuman, just thinking about it. I felt scared of him. And then ashamed, I was afraid of a friend. And placing his sunglasses back on his face, he turned away from me. The wishes between my lord and the landowner, I cannot discuss them. His voice was hard and cold. I moved as fast as my body would let me to catch up with him. and couldn't let him leave like this, not knowing when he would be back. At least he paused and let me catch up. Holding out my hand again, I stopped in front of him. Give me your number. What? The sudden demand made him return to the man I knew. You have a card or something, right? Give me a cell number. I'll call you. Give me a phone. I'll put the number in for you. I don't have it on me. I didn't want it to be smashed while finding werewolf, so I left it at home, and I haven't changed since. Letting out an annoyed sound, he went through his suit pockets. And finding a pen, he took my hand and wrote a 16-digit number, added in 202 on the back of it. I looked it over and stated the obvious. That's too many numbers. You believe in invisible shy werewolves, but you won't believe a cell number can be extra digits. My response was still in his sidekicking move, and after a few light hits against his polished shoes, I showed him mercy. I send you so many memes. That was not the right thing to say. Licking his thumb, he grabbed my hand and started to smudge the last two numbers as I screamed to him that I was kidding until he stopped. I wasn't kidding, but he did not need to know that. And keeping a number safe distance from him, I gave him a warning before he gave me the usual one. Stay safe out there, alright? If you're in the area, send me a message and I'll come and help. Before he could reply, his phone rang and he turned away to answer it. The conversation was quick and he started to walk towards his car before it was even finished. I need to go. Things are on fire. 
You should take a break. Can't house, can't hands deal with it? I asked, watching him start to leave. Hans is the one who set everything on fire. I didn't know how he handled doing this job, on top of having so many troublesome brothers. I wanted him to have less of a hectic life, but when I spoke with his parents, I asked for his freedom. It was not my place to control his life or tell him what I thought was best. It was his choice to do whatever job he wanted, and it did sound as if he was the only sensible agent around. This time he did not give me any warnings to stay out of trouble or to leave the cabin. And I was stuck with no one about the paranormal. And when his family came by for another meeting next summer, I would be here. His only demand was not to blow up his work phone with stupid cat videos and other memes. And I promised I wouldn't, and waved as he drove off down the dirt road outside the cabin. And once out of sight, I immediately broke that promise. Wow, 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 wow. Another one, wow. What a chest-pounding, an intriguing, riveting story there. For an incredible mind of 02321 over on Reddit, no sleep. Once again, 02, a refreshing and action-packed story with such lovable characters. And thank you ever so much for allowing me to narrate this on the channel. It really is a true honour, and I really do enjoy your writing so much. Well... Guys and girls as ever, you know the drill. Please do let me know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. And if you're an aspiring writer, why not get in touch with myself at the brand new contact email, which is as on screen. Contact the dead one at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope everybody's well this week, had a fantastic Halloween with friends or family, and are taking a fight back to life. But above all guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.